This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. Hey, 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 what the hell's going on? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 172. This is your host, Jason Michael, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today's interview is featuring Patrick Charles, a.k.a. Keepsake Glass. You can find him all over the social feeds and Instagram at Keepsake Glass. And uh, he has been in this field and community blown glass for the last four years. Uh, has a really interesting story. And it was fun to hear him talk about his journey starting off working for a production facility uh, to where he is now. And uh, is finding success in his work and just in life in general. It's, been, it's a pretty awesome conversation. It's fun to see someone uh, who's in his 20s and also a young glass artist that's really taken the whole concept and philosophy of understanding the path that has been paved, in a sense, uh, ahead of him uh, by those who who made the ways and the respect and honor that he has for them and the understanding that it isn't an easy thing just to pick up a torch and glass and learn how to make things. It's, it takes a lot of work and dedication, and he's definitely done that and proven himself not only by uh, this conversation we had, but also if you go on his Instagram and you see his work, uh, his work is top-notch, and it's really, really, really well-done stuff. Um, he's currently in the one of the competitors right now in the Tournament of Fire that's going on, the third the third series this year we're in. Uh, right now, as I'm recording this, we're all waiting Got about another 45 minutes of the, the voting for round one starts, and myself, I'm very anxious to find out, and I'm actually second guessing what I made and all that shit. The whole imposter syndrome is kicking in, and I know all of us in this group that are chatting, we're all saying the same fucking thing. <laughs> There's 16 incredible artists in there, and I'm gonna put myself in there because I think I'm pretty good at what I do, and it's just fun to see. You know, the first round was making a chillum, and uh, to see the different perspectives of what all the artists brought to the table. There's some pretty amazing stuff on there. So if you want to go check out the fun, uh, check out the Tournament of Fire itself on Instagram. It's at tournament underscore of underscore fire. I'll have the link in the show notes for you as well. And uh, also go check out the kids over at Cherry Glass that are putting this on for us. It's a really interesting concept. And uh, look forward to working with these guys in future tournaments as we begin to uh, really get this out to the masses and really conceptualize even more so what they've been got uh, what they have going on here uh, if that makes any sense <laughs> so <laughs> we want to bring it bring it to a bigger audience basically is what i'm trying to say so yeah uh just real quick too don't forget that the flow magazine is offering all you out there that have not yet subscribed to their magazine 10 percent off all you have to do is go and put in the code wise guy at checkout w-y-z-g-u-y at checkout i don't get anything extra out of it but they get a little bit of uh love from you by being a subscriber and you get 10% off for subscribing and being a listener to the audience as they are one of our sponsors. And uh, Mountain Glass has all their wonderful fun sales going on constantly. Got something new in the mail. So go check out mountainglass.com for all the fun things going on there in Mountain Glass. And then we have Glassroots Art Show coming up soon. They are out there up in Madison, Wisconsin, getting prepared for the show in October which I can't wait to go and see all the faces and then all the glass that's being revealed and everything. It's just, I'm, I'm excited to uh, be there this year, which will be my first official trade show. And I know last year I said the same fucking thing and uh, things just didn't happen. Life got crazy. And this year I've already got the time off work. I've got a wedding to go to in Kentucky and then on the way up there, uh, going to be stopping in Kentucky from Florida and then going from Florida up into Madison and bringing my daughter along with me. She's going to be my assistant, and uh, as she's my project manager right now for the online courses going on, and she's going to help me do filming and video and get everybody, uh, basically be my handler for the artist to come in and do interviews in person. And that being said, if you are going to Glassroots and you would like to get on the show, uh, I'm going to be holding interviews for two days. Uh, we have a green room set aside for me that's soundproof. Uh, we'll have uh, make sure there's red M&Ms in there for you because I know all you little divas out there, and you got to have one color M&M in a bowl. And uh, actually, it's kind of a 
side story. I don't know if you know the origins of that whole green M&M bullshit. Uh, but I believe it was... Uh, I'm having a brain fart here. Alice Cooper. There you go. Alice Cooper, I believe, is who this was. Uh, he was one of the first people out there in the world of rock and roll to require that the place he would go to, the arenas, the event, location, whatever... Uh, had a bowl of green M&Ms and the reason he did that was he felt that if those that were putting on his show his stage hands the the place itself he was going to he knew if they had their shit together and paid attention to detail because he had pyrotechnics and all that stuff going on in his show that had to get set up properly and safely uh, details that if they had a bowl of green M&Ms waiting for him that they knew that they were detail oriented and uh, that he didn't have to worry about going there and potentially uh, blowing up the stage it's kind of a fun little side thing, and that's just turned into a, a whole diva conversation. But we're all divas, I guess, at heart when it comes down to it. <laughs> so that being said, uh, I'm going to be there doing interviews. I'm uh, going to do some video work as well, and I'm really excited about the whole concept and situation what we got planned for it. So stay tuned as we get closer to October for updates and what have you. Uh, but if you would like to get into uh, on the show and do an interview with me, uh, you can hit me up at wiseguymedia at gmail.com, W-Y-Z-G-U-Y media at gmail.com I'll have a little link in the show notes as always to get a hold of me there and if you have any questions comments, concerns, uh, complaints ideas, concepts for the show anything like that definitely feel free to contact me on that email I definitely enjoy getting emails from you and I've been getting a lot over the last months from support and love and everything else and uh, I'm going to end this giveaway I'm doing for our uh, little thank you bribe for going on and either leaving a review on iTunes or posting your favorite episode on Instagram and sharing it with your friends. Uh, if you do do the iTunes review and you uh, are able to do that for me, all you got to do is take a screenshot of your review, send me an email with the screenshot as well as your shipping information, and I'll get your pendant out to you as long as it was well as like a little sticker pack I put together. And then on the social media side of things on Instagram, if you just do a screenshot of what your favorite episode that you're listening to, and then uh, tag at wiseguy underscore radio on the thing there. You can tag at J. Michael Glass in there too if you want. Um, and then uh, send me a DM as well with your shipping information and I'll make sure I get that pendant out to you as a big thank you for sharing the love and getting exposure to the show. Because really what I'm trying to do is just expose our community and how amazing we all are and this um, awesome group of thousands of us, if not millions of us now, uh, as we continue to grow daily, internationally wise. So I love it. Um, yeah. So that being said, I'm going to get out of here. Time to uh, get another interview going. We have a lot of amazing talent coming on this show, which I'm super honored to have uh, those that I've had on even recently, including having on Patrick today. He's very talented at a young age. And uh, these upcoming interviews are going to be amazing, as always. So until then, thanks for tuning in to episode 171. Oh, no. This is 172 with Patrick Charles, a.k.a. Keepsake Glass. Again, go follow him on Instagram at Keepsake Glass. And uh, we'll go from there. And until then, stay hydrated. It's still summertime. I know we're all sweating. Unless you're out in the mountains somewhere, you may not be. But uh, stay hydrated. Be good to each other. And we'll talk to you next time. Talk to you soon. Love you so much. Bye-bye. Peace. Man's inhumanity to man, all those things cause complication and creation. See, the domination of one nation to another nation, all those things cause complication. See? Hey, what's up, Patrick? Welcome to the show. Hello, how's it going? Pretty good, man. Another beautiful Sunday here in Florida. Hot and rainy and sunny and all that kind of mixture of whatever we get Oh, here. we're sharing similar weather then out here in Dallas. It is hot and rainy, and it's actually overcast, though. Nice. Makes for a good day to blow glass. That it does, especially when you're lucky like me and you have an air-conditioned shop. <laughs> yeah, it's nice, dude. I'm spoiled at Disney with the AC in there, too. So I definitely uh, oh, understand. Dude, yeah. <laughs>
especially being uh, my first two years I spent, I did it in the hot summer of Arizona with no air conditioning. So this is like a, just, I'm spoiled now. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah. We'll definitely get into your studio talk for sure, but uh, before we get too off topic here, and I just want to just quickly say that too, that we are uh, recording this to, on the day of the first round of judging for the Tournament of Fire, uh, third round of the Tournament of Fire, and we're going to get into some topics, talks about that and how we got prepared for this and you know all that stuff, so definitely, definitely pumped for this chat, dude, but before we get there, let's go ahead and have you give us your superhero origin story and where you got blown, uh, blown glass there. Oh, well, origin story, ah, you know, definitely from Earth, born here on Earth. Uh, <laughs> fast forward from birth to 21 years later, and that's when I first got into glass. I've been working a few jobs since I was 16, and I found a production company in Arizona for blowing glass. And at this point, I owned very little glass in my life, but I, <clears throat> I wanted something new. I was working pretty much dead end jobs and this seemed kind of like a, a change of pace something I would kind of give me a fresh start so that's why I applied I applied at this company and um, they're pretty big so they would hire you with no experience and teach you to you know do prep basically first day I pulled a couple hundred stringers and went from stringers to pulling points to uh you know, breaking down tubing, all sorts of prep, so the artists they had on staff could use that prep to make production pipes. And eventually I moved on to pipes and did that for a few months, and I just got burnt out on production, so I ended up deciding to leave. And <clears throat> at that point when I left, that's when it hit me like a ton of bricks how much I loved the craft of glasswork. I just hated production. So I wanted to save up some money and set up my own studio. Hell yeah! Did you did you find like Which before before the glass? Did you do other kind of art beforehand? Yeah, actually, I've been a uh, creative my whole life. Been in music. That's that's where my creative outlet was up until glass. In fact, there was a another version of life where I wanted to be a professional musician. So, hmm. <clears throat> but uh, that's it definitely wasn't my, my bag. There's, there's a lot of effort you have to put in to anything you're going to be successful at in life. And once I found glass, I decided I really wanted to put the effort in there. Yeah. It's funny you say that, man. Cause I, I, the struggle I have a lot is like with creative energy and like, I haven't hardly had any extra creative energy to put into anything else. Like I play guitar and draw and write and all that other stuff. And, uh, it's, you know, my podcast is my other creative outlet in a sense. And, but really, like my right. the art in a sense is you know it, all that energy goes into my glass, and because I'm the same way, like, I, I love I love music, more. but you know, but yeah, it's, it's tricky, right? It's a weird right, it's a, yeah. It's a weird thing. And I found glass music kind of fell to the wayside, so <laughs> and it has ever since. I haven't really gotten back into it as heavily because all my efforts go into creating glass. Yeah. Do you ever get a jam out here and there? Yeah, yeah. I still, you know, I'll sit down at the end of a day and over maybe a month or two months I'll, I'll try and get a song written or something that'll help me kind of <clears throat> arrange the thoughts in my head how I want them but um, no not, not not any regular jams but I pick up my instruments every now and then so it's not like I'm missing them yeah yeah exactly yeah same here mine's always on the stand just to be picked up but then I go to, go to play yeah. my, and I have an acoustic that I play but then I go to play it for like maybe 30-40 minutes and my fingertips are killing me and it's like <laughs> you know <laughs> fuck it yeah, I'm I'm my I'm at the point where the hand muscles are gone. So I'll play for 20 minutes and my hand starts to cramp. I yeah. still have the calluses, but my hand will cramp. And so I just I put down the guitar. That's funny. Hell yeah, man. Well, when you were <laughs> when you first started doing the pipes and stuff, like what were you doing in the production side of things? Oh, uh, basically, uh, what you think when you hear the word gas station pipe? Okay. Uh, I was making lots of those. You, know, you had a quota. There was they have about let's say 20 to 30 glass blowers on staff. And you had to hit a quota, <clears throat> and my per design the quota will change. But I was in the quota of 50 pipes per day, hmm. and now it's even more. So I had to make 50 of these per day, and they were, you know, you squiggle on some stringers, throw down some silver fume. Actually, you do that. You throw down the silver fume, squiggle on some stringers, then shape your pipe out, and throw that in the kiln. And the whole thing's supposed to take you five to eight minutes. And so <clears throat> I was making those. For a few months and it really burned me out on the whole process 
I just fell out of love with it. Yeah, it's easy to do that, especially when you first get into it. Because like when I first got into the, the production side of things, I was doing like pendants and jewelry and stuff. So it wasn't like you know the functional side of things. But then when I was like I started doing pipe production, it was the same way. I was like pulling points and stringers, and then I was uh, then I started grad like graduated to decorating points where I would just do wrap and rakes, and then hand it over to my the guy my buddy Daniel who was showing me the pipe process from the very beginning. And then every five or six pipes, I would like shape that one out, and then eventually I was all the way through shaping them out. But it was it oh right it oh was, that's a cool way to learn it nice. It was, but it, make then, up the process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just and that's how I've taught it since. It's just kind of like one thing leads to the next, you know. Just kind of keep your muscle memory going, but it can be difficult that's to, to you know, like you're saying, it's starting off brand new, and you're thrown into the fire of like, okay, we need fifty of these a day, and it's like, fuck, man. Yeah, yeah, they, and that was how it was. It was they let you know from day one, like, look, this isn't going to be easy. Uh, it's going to be really hard, and we're going to we're going to push you, and it's not for everybody. They 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 let you know that from day one. There was no ifs and or buts about it. Yeah. So uh, I knew what I was getting into. Just for me, I want I was thirsty for something different, and I was ready to work hard. So I just fell in love with the challenge, and uh, <clears throat> that's I couldn't be more grateful for the first five seven months I had of blowing glass because it was all production. I spent eight hours a day doing the same thing over and over again, which built my fundamentals, which helped me springboard to trying new things and teaching myself over the next years to come. Without that, I wouldn't be where I am. Yeah, bro, that's huge. So very- yeah, it's huge. And that's what I preach too. It's like you got to really go into it and just spend the first year just doing production just to really learn your medium instead of just being yeah, like, oh, I'm going to make rigs today. <laughs> right, yeah. It's, it it kind of makes me cringe when I see someone trying to make rigs uh, just not not because I I don't like the work. It's just because I see that man. If you had built in your fundamentals, you could be making such cleaner stuff before you're trying to go straight for a rig. Kind of yeah, like yeah. watching someone stumble while they're trying to run before they even learn to walk. Yeah, exactly. Yep, that's exactly it, dude. That's how I always talk about it because it's definitely you got to crawl before you walk <laughs> in that whole you know moniker of things. Yeah. It's so true. It's just a lot of work, you know, when you get into it, you see other people starting and you see them, maybe they're two or three years down the road, but you've just been introduced to them and you see their work and you're like, oh, I want to make stuff like that. Mm-hmm. This guy's an independent artist doing it by himself or her, this person, this, this person is doing things by themselves on their own terms. I want to do that for myself. Well, maybe I can do that. So they start to see what it involves. They save up some money, get a torch, buy some glass, and then they want to start getting into it and they don't really appreciate the effort that the person before them put into it to get to where they were. Yeah. And that's just a result of the internet and all this technology and it's really no one's specific fault and it is what it is. Yeah, man, it's so true. You see all these people out there that no matter what field they're in that are highly successful. And don't get me wrong, there are like the quote unquote overnight successes, your Ubers and those kind of things, but like the majority of these people that are successful, it took them 10, 15, 20 years and you don't see all the effort they put into it. I mean, like I, whenever I do like the great American teachings here, my, my ex-wife was a teacher here or she still is, but I used to go to her school and demo and I was brought up skateboarders and you always see these guys pulling off these tricks, but you didn't see Tony Hawk fall 10,000 times before he figured out how to make it through the 900. You know, we're just seeing them pulling off the trick. You saw the edit of landing these great tricks, but you did not see them biffing it. 10 times for every one time they landed it. Yeah, exactly. I think part of the, one of my favorite scenes in Degenerate Art was seeing Yushin get try to nail that trick that he was doing. And, uh, yeah. that, you know, and they eventually <laughs> nails it, you know, it's like, but, and glass is the same way. It's like, you just got to keep practicing and fucking up and breaking shit and figuring out what you did wrong. And then next thing you know, that's the truth, man, Degenerate Art, that is a, that is a piece of history right there that I think is a little bit underrated as far as even by the, you know, and the people that were in it, mm-hmm. I appreciate that so much, and it's kind of a, it, it started a movement. That film it yeah. started a movement, and yeah, it's incredible to have met. And I, you know, I talked to Snick a couple months ago and told him about. You know, it was the first time I met him. I told him I saw the movie. That's where I saw him first, and and uh, him and a few other artists. He was so humble. And he's like, oh, yeah, the German art. Got to thank Slinger for that. That was. That was some interesting times, and at no point did he take any credit for any anything that I was trying to give him credit for. It was like just being a pavement, you know, a, a path maker and 
all, all sorts of stuff and inspiring others through his work. He's, well, that's great. I appreciate that. I was just doing what I was doing. And yeah. that's so awesome to see these artists just, I'm just being me. If I, if I inspire others, awesome. But that was not their intention from the set out. Yeah, exactly. There's, yeah. And like you're saying with technology cool. nowadays, it's like, you know, it's, there's lots of ways of getting influenced, but there's also lots of ways to get frustrated and overwhelmed, you know? <laughs> yeah. Lots of input, man. Yeah, a lot of input these days. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, and part of the reason I got this podcast going was because of the new generation of artists that were inspired from degenerate art that came out out of the woodworks, you know, it's like made this whole new yeah. movement. I, I will I will raise my hand and admit I am one of them. You know, I saw that movie before I ever got into glass. And then a year later, I started getting into glass and I watched it again and I watched it again and again. And it definitely, it started something. And all the way down, I got to give you credit for this podcast. I mean, I've been listening to this thing for a little over a year and a half now uh, since I discovered it. And I've, I learned things that I didn't know. And... It's pretty incredible to be able to have uh, a source like this for information as an artist. Yeah, thanks. So man. degenerate art, or whether it be something like that, it's <clears throat> I have to express my appreciation for it because without stuff like this, I wouldn't be where I am. That's just the truth. Hell yeah, well, I appreciate that. And that's yeah, you know, that's my whole my whole goal and hope of this whole thing. If I just help one person. And uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback throughout the years, and it's you know now going on three years, which is just crazy. <laughs> Time's flying, <laughs> you know. But fuck, yeah, man. I'm sure it feels like yesterday, man. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, I remember just sitting around thinking about the concept of this show and how I was gonna do it, and had no idea even how to re- do edit, a, edit, a, you know, audio and that kind of stuff. So it's it's fun, and it's and this is just like me doing my glass, man. It's, I had to learn this shit on my own. Like there's tutorials and you know people out there that helped out. Don't get me wrong, but. You know, I hear a lot of right. people talking about like, okay, I'm, I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this. I'm like, dude, stop fucking thinking about trying and just go fucking do it. And then you'll figure it out on the way, you know, all the mistakes you make on how to do it better. And, you know. Nah, man, I totally hear that. I mean, you see it. You see other people saying things like, don't ask for permission. Just go out and do it. Mm-hmm. Don't tell the world what you're about to do. Just go out and do it. And it's, there, there are lots of people saying, you know, I want to do this. I want to do that. It's like, okay, we'll do it, you know. So... Yeah, I hear it at work all the damn time. Oh, I want to do that. And then my first thing I say is, well, if you don't mind cutting and burning yourself every day, then uh, that's the first stage of, of understanding. <laughs> you know? Exactly. That's that's the kind of introduction someone needs when they, they say something like, I would love to do that. It's like, Well, think about it real quick. If you, if you like being challenged to the point of failure, if you like cutting and burning yourself or any, anything in between, then this might be for you. Mm-hmm. But if any of that doesn't sound fun, it's probably not for you. <laughs> yeah, if you're one sadistic motherfucker, then this is the job for you. <laughs> yes. If you like getting scars, this is definitely your crap. Yeah, man. I've always said like we're like the S&M of the art world when it comes down to it. <laughs> you know. Yeah, it's it's pretty gnarly. It's gotten I mean, when I got into the craft, I definitely had a bit of a weak constitution for seeing gross photos, but after seeing the injuries people sustain from this craft, it's definitely <laughs> it's strengthened my resolve to be able to look at some nasty burns and cuts. Yeah, man, I'm sure including your own here and there. Yeah, I've had I've had a few bad ones. Uh never any burns that sent me to the hospital. Yeah. Uh well, definitely only cover- one cut where I had to go get stitched. Other than that, nothing that bad. Yeah. Well you can share that story here at the end for sure. Okay. Uh, <laughs> right and our, and our little lightning round. Yeah, man. I always like to like to hear the, the gore. It's fun. Yeah, definitely. I got a I got a good one. Hell yeah! So with, with the studio that you're working at, because you know I, I hear a lot about these glass studios that have you know thirty, forty, fifty people in there that are all newbies or they're just learning one specific thing. Like these guys just pu- push bulls all day, you know. Um, right. You know, did, when you were learning that process, though, like you so you did stringers, you did points, and then you were thrown into a pattern and, and a piece. Did they teach you like just the process of popping holes and pushing bulls too, or was it like you were just fucking things up until you figured it out? Uh, well, the process was uh, I spent about two months on prep, and while I was on prep, if I worked a full 40 hours in the week, I could clock off early on Friday and have what they called free time, which meant I could do anything I wanted. So actually, I was able to kind of see other people make a pipe or something, and then in my free time, practice that and fuck up kind of without wasting any of their time or money. So... Um, that was how I got my basic exposure to, you know, making my first pipe. But when I first got thrown into it, 
it was pretty much day one. All right, you're ready. You're on pipes. Here's your uh, sample. Try and make that and see how many you can make. And then the next day, do the same. And then day three, all right, you have a quota. Here's 50. Make 50 of them. Wow. And how many can you make first quality? And they go back into the back of the, the shop and someone quality tests them and say, I made 30 that day. 20 came back second quality, 10 were first quality. And that was a good day, you know. The yeah. next day, you improve. Make 12 first quality. And then the next day, you improve. And at that point, they had me switching to a new pipe every week. So I'd make... A, a new design every single week. I went through probably 10 or 12 designs before I kind of got burnt out on it and uh, decided to to go my own way. Yeah, man, it's tough because I, I know myself, I've had this that type of environment having artists in there working with me and teaching from the very beginning and doing production. And, you know, I definitely understand like the creative person doesn't always enjoy repeating themselves, you know, but... Yeah. You know. Lucky for me, I got I, I had a paradigm of this is my job. Mm -hmm. I got hired there to work 40 hours a week for eight dollars an hour, you know. So uh, whether or not I wanted to do it, it was what I had to do to make money. So well, it's smart. same as someone wakes up and goes and does an office job. That was what I woke up and went to do. And it was okay with me. Yeah, man. But even like in, when you get out of that environment and you're doing your own thing, it's like you got to treat it like a job. Oh, yeah. You know, it's you, different. You, yeah, oh, you totally. definitely have to have a lot more discipline to yeah. get to that point. Yeah. I had to learn that, you know, at first it was a job and then it wasn't and I stopped treating it like one and <laughs> life came and kicked me in the pants a little bit and I had to learn, oh, I need some discipline with this craft. Otherwise, I'm not going to make money with it. <laughs> yeah, dude, you got to like, like I've, I've gotten to a point when I do my own, when I was doing my studio stuff, like I had a bunch of old t-shirts I'd cut the sleeves off of and these were like my uniform shirts, you know, and like I would make sure every day I get up and I'd pack my bowl and get my uniform on and go out to the shop. And my uniform, you know, is a pair of flip flops and board shorts and my cut off t shirts. But like I knew if I had that on, I was in glass blowing mode. And, right. you know, I'd go out there and set a schedule for myself and, you know, nine to five or 10 to five or 10 to six or 10 to three or whatever the fuck it was, you know, and just get like a regular schedule going. And it, it, it's like you're saying, it's not always easy to do. And there's days where you want to fuck off or days you want to not work at all, you know? Right. They, those come along. And sometimes yeah. you. You can enjoy the perks of being self-employed and take a day off. Yeah, it's just but, scheduling those days in. I mean, if you can just set a schedule and be like, you know, these are my theme days and this day I'm not doing anything, then that, you know, do it. Yeah. Now, I'll, I'll admit it took me probably a year of being self-employed for me to learn that that was important. You know, a year I'd, I'd spend a couple of days working and then I'd spend two days fucking off and playing video games with my friends online and mm -hmm. get lost in a Call of Duty tournament or something. And then I'd... I'd realize like, oh man, I've got less than a hundred dollars in my bank account, and the only thing I can do right now is go blow some glass to make some money. Yeah. And enough enough times of that happening, I you know had to realize like, nope, I got to treat it like a job now. I can't just blow glass when I feel like it and hope to keep my bills covered. So it yeah, did man. take almost a year of of fucking around to get my head on straight, but I did eventually. Well, you know, and you, and you did a smart thing too by going and getting that job because, like, you know, it's like doing an internship somewhere to learn a skill. Like, uh, uh, what the fuck's guy Kawasaki that wrote the Rich Dad Poor Dad book series. One of the things, like that, that whole series is all about like overcoming your own personal adversity. And one of the things that he was always afraid of was the fear of being told no. So the way he learned how to be told no was by getting a job at Xerox and was told no thousands of times. And eventually he became the number one salesperson for Xerox and as soon as he got that accomplishment he quit his fucking job and went on to the next thing to learn the next skill and wow. you, know, you know ideally it's the whole just going and learning skill sets like right now with my position over at the mouse house and getting a chance to be in the hot shop I'm learning a whole new skill set in glass so if another hot shop has an opening somewhere that might seem better or down the road or whatever you know I've got this skill set now behind behind me to be able to do that and I think, you know, on that same note with social media, the way it is, it's teaching us all how to market ourselves as business people, not just as like oh, a bunch yes. of goofy glass blowers, which going into this tournament that we're in, I think is killer. One of the things that Scott and I talked about in his interview was about the fact that they're, this tournament is teaching people how to do live streaming, how to market themselves, how to talk to their community, how to build relationships, keep in touch with your shop owners, all that shit. You know, yes, very real life applications. Yeah, it's awesome, and the fact that we get an opportunity to you know get orders and win a little bit of money and blah blah blah. It's you know it's 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 killer, and these are the kind of things that you have to do. There's nothing worse than I hate when I hear somebody saying, "Oh, I didn't have time to do that," and I'm like, "Okay, well, so what did you do today? How long were you watching Netflix?" <laughs> 
Right. Yeah. I think the same thing. And usually I'll, I'll, so those words will come out of my mouth. Oh, I didn't have time. And in my brain, I say, wait, hold on. Did you just lie to yourself? Mm-hmm. Did you not make time? And that's usually the case. I didn't make time. I always have time. And if I sit down at the end of the day and say, how much time cumulatively did I spend watching Netflix on Facebook, doing things on Instagram that weren't business related and, you know, all other forms of fucking off, I did have time. Yep. So I definitely agree with you there. And usually <laughs> I try and hold myself accountable. Yeah, that. yeah. And that's the that's how you start. It's 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 just being mindful about it. And don't get me wrong, man, after eighteen years of blowing glass and being forty years old, I'm still working on that shit. <laughs> you know? You know? Yeah, definitely. No one <laughs> no one ever gets it right perfect hundred percent of the time. No, so uh-uh. Yeah, being so. young, I just have to appreciate my situation, which is, you know, I compare myself to a lot of people that are older, which isn't always good. And in fact, often it's not good to compare yourself to others. Mm-hmm. But I always forget like, oh, I still have a lot of time to make the improvements I need to make. So while I'm comparing myself, I almost get myself, you know, in an emergent state of mind like, oh, I need to go. I need to get better. I need to do this. And wait, slow down. You've got time. Don't compare yourself to anybody but who you were yesterday. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, and, and you can tell, though, by your work that you obviously got a good foundation and then went off on your own and you started figuring out certain, you know, wigwags, patterns, etc. on your own by dedicating yourself to it, you know. And I guess, like, when you got into getting, t- and you know, into other th- realms of glass, like, you know, the more functional side of things besides hand pipes and whatever, like, did you take any classes at all or is it just watching videos on YouTube? Like how'd you go about learning that process? Uh, the process for all that was really yeah, as videos and self-taught processes. Um, I've not, not for lack of trying, but I have never taken a class before. Mostly just haven't, I haven't been able to afford it. So, mm-hmm. um, YouTube videos were my best friend when I first set up my own studio. And then after I had tried, you know, enough techniques, based on the videos I it was about a year into working for myself and I was comfortable enough with trying other stuff and, and then just teaching myself through my failures I try something and think I'll be doing it right and just fuck it up completely and ended up you know it'd go right into the scrap bucket but the knowledge that I gained from that it couldn't be thrown away yeah exactly yeah that's well said man that's well said because it's that's the part of it's so important it's like as soon as you fuck up and you can stop and contemplate real quick on it what you did wrong and then go back and just do it again and i tell people like kids all the time are like how are you doing that i'm like oh it's like riding a bike except you gotta scrape your knees and get back on and keep riding right you can't just yeah put man your bike away. You're, you're, that's a great thing to you know, think about it man you can't just ask so how are you riding that bike up the street well i could try to explain it to you but let me just teach you to ride the bike or let me show you how you can teach yourself to ride the bike. Yeah, exactly. One of the two. There's no way to really explain the process. Yeah, yeah. And I, there was a, uh, I went to a, a convention last year, Dave Ramsey puts on, and there was a guy talking, and one of my favorite things, my takeaways was it was he was talking about the whole parable about, you know, take, teaching a, taking a man to the water to teach him to fish kind of thing, and then he can feed himself or, you know, whatever. And uh, his whole thing was, you know, really truly taking the person to the water and actually teaching them so you never have to take them again. They can just keep teaching, taking yourself. You know, and right, you know, exactly. it's, it's just, but it's just the person has to be able to take, you know, I hate to keep on bringing up cliches, but the whole bringing a horse to water, you know, type thing, <laughs> you know, they may or may exactly, not drink from yeah. it, you know, <laughs> you have to be prepared to take on that, whether it be water or information that you, you have to be prepared to take it on. Yeah. And then put so, it into action. Ex- exactly. And so you hear this whole thing, learn by doing, learn by doing. I've heard that a lot in my life. Well, mm-hmm. Take it one step further with class. You learn by doing and expecting failure. Don't expect success every single time. Expect just something to happen, and usually the first few attempts, are gonna, you're going to fail. Mm-hmm. You're going to end up with nothing except for knowledge, and that's more valuable than than anything else. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> and that's why a lot of times, too, I always preach about just practicing things in clear just to understand the move set to where you're getting from A to Z to your final piece, and then you can start 100%. adding all your prep and patterns and wig wags and opals and everything else into it. Because there's nothing worse than trying to figure something out for the first time and you got five, six hours into it and then nothing to show at the end. Yep. And that'll you'll see that scale from small to big as you as you spend years doing it. When I first started, you know, all my imagination could only go as far as my skill would allow it, which mm-hmm. was 
basic pipes. So I'd want to do a pipe with a bunch of horns on it or something like that, something just crazy. I'd want to push my boundaries knowing that I wasn't able to make a rig yet, but I want to do some crazy pipe. And I'd, I'd make it, and the horn attachments wouldn't come out great, or they'd be flimsy, or something something would go wrong. And I ultimately wouldn't be happy with the piece. But I learned a lot from those pieces that I wasn't happy with. And now, more often than not, I make pieces that I can I can learn to be happy with. Hell yeah. Yeah, so that being said, what when did you get to a point in your in your gl- own glass where you're able to go out and start hitting the road to sell your stuff? Oh, well, that was a matter of uh, how I wanted to sell my stuff. So, if I if I wanted to do what a lot of people have done, which is build up a case and take it to a shop, it would have taken me a little longer, but I had Instagram at my fingertips. So, I set up my own studio in uh in my garage. And I was working at at a grocery store while I was doing that. And for about three months, I had a job while I was blowing glass. And after that, I had, you know, with the previous experience I had with my first job, I had enough skill to where I was comfortable just making and selling crappy pipes to my friends and anyone following me on Instagram. So I started doing auctions because I saw that was a thing. I saw other people doing auctions. So it took me about three or four months of of every day blowing glass before I decided to just take the plunge and go off on my own and quit my job and start selling glass. And even then it was still pretty tight. You know, I, I didn't, I only made a certain amount of money and I had to live on a budget. I still have to live on a budget because (laughs) things are the way they are across, you know, all sorts of economies whether Mm -hmm. it be the american economy or the world economy so um but i I found myself very thirsty to get on my own as soon as possible so uh i found instagram was my best way to make sales and then some local shops i i got into it at a time where most local shops were buying import glass they were not supporting local artists as much as they had been in the past so I mostly looked to the online community at that point. Oh, huh, interesting. Yeah, it's it's such a weird dynamic in the smoke shops because because you know back in the day when doing this stuff, they're like glass pipes were few and far between. You had like Chameleon and a couple guys driving around the country in their station wagons and cars selling stuff as distributors, and then we got hit by the you know the feds came in and then we mm-hmm. all freaked out and went underground and then all of a sudden boom the import market went fucking ape shit and yeah it did you know and then all of a sudden the cannabis laws started changing and social media came out and then that kind of seemed like it i mean i know the import influx is still there however it seems like the with the local glass blower now was able to fill in some of those gaps but then like all of a sudden i've seen another resurgence of imports it's it's weird and it's yep. a, and it's a lot of the same shit that was made fucking 10 years ago like i see the same elephant or fish or you know it's like the same five-year-old kid's now 10 years old, but he's over there in India making some fucking glass, you know, <laughs> whatever yeah, the hell it is. <laughs> it's coming from all over, and whether it's in India or China or any over there in Asia, I've also seen what I would classify as import shops here in America. Mm-hmm. You know, I see people running shops with uh, undocumented workers and making just they, – they use nothing but Chinese glass, and they put together a, a piece and put a bacon on it and call it American Made. And that just – that's cutting so many corners. I think it's disrespectful to call it American Made at that point. So yeah, totally. It's a fucking it's, lie. Yeah. It's coming from all sorts of different areas. It's And it's – a lot of it, it's demand, you know. Yep. There wouldn't be a supply without the demand. There are people out there on a budget who don't care where their glass came from. They just want something that percolates water mm-hmm. for under $100. Yep. So that market will always be alive, and it's upon – an artist like me and perhaps yourself if you'd like to take that on or any of us artists that call ourselves artists it's our responsibility to educate people as to the pipe culture not just you know you want to buy a bong that's cool go to a smoke shop and do your thing that's fine but if you want to be involved in the artistic pipe culture that's been being built for over 20 years by leaders of it now then it's our responsibility to teach them. Here's what it is to be a pipe maker in the U.S. and now across the world. They're in the U.K., they're in Spain, they're in Denmark, they're all over, just actual pipers I respect because they're in the culture. 
Yeah, man, and it's, and it's frustrating too because there's so many artists out there and glass artists and glass blowers in general that could be the China killers that the shops don't need to buy import. And I, I always wonder just from being around and seeing how some businesses have worked that a lot of these, not, not a lot, but there's some shops that'll, that'll barter with other distributors. They'll, they'll have a product and they'll trade their product for the pipes. You know, right. Or, you know, I've seen it happen. And then in fact, I've done it myself. Yeah. Yeah. hundred <clears throat> percent. I think a lot of it just boils down to ignorance you know, some smoke shop owners just don't know. So they buy what they, they have. They buy mm-hmm. what they have access to. They don't know, one, where their glass is coming from, or two, if it's causing any harm to any of these local artists, you know. Yep. So. Yeah, or they just don't care because it's all numbers. Exactly. And they're, they're in it for, it's just their work. They're in it for the money. And they, they couldn't really care less about the culture. Yep. Which I'm not going to hold that against anyone. No, Fine. I Those understand it. Out there, I couldn't. I couldn't care less about either. So yeah, business is business. Just so happened. Yep, business is business. So I appreciate when I can find a smoke shop out there that will seek to do business only with local artists, and they won't get any import whatsoever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I completely agree, man. They're 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 good to find, and you know, it's talking with Nick the other day about with glass roots and the trade show circuit. And I've just been curious, like a lot of times I've called shops up for, you know, to see how they're doing with my glass and whatever. And a lot of them are like, Oh, we've got a small budget this month. Cause we're going to whatever trade show. And then they don't order for like three months because of it. Cause then they go and they spend their money at the trade shows. instead of buying from the local glass blowers or whatever. And yeah, you know, it's, yep. it's, it's a weird I've dynamic that, and, like, and frustrating at times. It definitely can be, especially for, for guys like you that have been in it for so long. You've seen, it changed from one thing to another. You know, you started before the smartphones were a thing, so there wasn't even an Instagram, you know, and now seeing what it is, it can definitely understand how it would be frustrating for people that have been in it longer than four years like me. I'm still a baby in this craft and I have to remind myself every day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's and it's it's like the, the you know, it's a it's a weird catch 22 or a circle of whatever you want to call it because like you know the artist gets frustrated because they can't sell to their local smoke shops they're not selling to whoever so they say fuck it and they go directly to the customer and then the smoke shop gets pissed off because you're selling directly to the customer so they stop buying from you it's like okay well we all need to get on the same page here and have some kind of standardization or something of some sort i don't you know i'd say probably impossible but there could be yeah. you know organizations that are created or a guilds or whatever, where like this select group of all these smoke shops that are in this one thing have access to this, to you know this group of artists over here or something of that you know something that can come up, so we're all on the same page. Right. And, and then we get into educating each other about the glass and what's going on, and we talk about laws and every state's fucking different, whether it's eighteen or twenty one, and you know it's just it's there's so much bullshit <laughs> we gotta there deal is, with. There is man. There's a lot of there's a lot of rules to this game you have to abide by. Yeah. And yeah. so I, I, I agree with that. And, and this is a very young industry, very young. And it's been, in, in my four years of being into it, it has exploded from something very small into what is turning huge. You know, you're starting to see corporate guys put in their money into mm-hmm. whether it be uh, the cannabis side of it or the glass side of it. There's, there's people that have no interest other than investing some money to make some money and that's when you start seeing industries explode and that's what we're seeing with cannabis and with certain parts of glass now i'm not saying that about art glass but especially with production and stuff you got big huge factories with millions of dollars into them so they can start cranking out production glass Mm -hmm. it's pretty incredible yeah, and, and I, I have heard stories or quote unquote rumors of specific shop owners that have lots of money who have actually only opened up smoke shops to draw attention to them so that when cannabis is legal in their area or medical wise, they can then have a dispensary location set up already. You know, it's kind yep, of you know yep. interesting kind of thing. And then, I've you know, with all these e-cigarette liquid juice places everywhere, I've always wondered that too. It's like are all these little places like just waiting for things to go legal. So now they already have a shop. So then they can just bring that product into it. And next thing you know, you got a hundred distributors and, and dispensaries, I should say on one block. You know? Absolutely. And these people are almost, you know, they're, they're giving themselves head starts. So when the, the starting pistol fires, they're already, you know, 200 yards down the lane. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. It's, Which it's, is, you know, that's how business is done. 
Yeah, absolutely. But you know, it's it's interesting thinking about that too, because like you know, we're talking pre-show, like you know, or even just now with about the the production side of things. And I know for a lot of my generation, who had to to survive by doing production, you know, and and a lot of us got burnt out. I mean, fuck, I'm still burnt out from doing production. And it's been probably five years since <coughs> I've done it. Except, I mean, I do it at work all the time, but it's a whole different thing there. But you know, the right, yeah. the, the I've always said that those that have been in this industry for at least the last ten years got a little bit of a head start on where things are going to come from but it's i think it's for those that can change the mentality to understand that you don't necessarily have to do production you can do one-offs and some high-end production per se and let the newbies come in and do the production mode it's 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 a weird thing to get used to the social medias and you know your generation grew up with it where you know i'm still getting used to having a freaking phone in my pocket all damn time yeah, for me, you know, my generation, us glass blowers that have been in for five years or less, this is all normal for us. Yeah. So it's definitely <clears throat> there's a weird paradigm shift there from one generation to another. Yeah, it's funny when you tell a ten year old kid that I've started doing this before YouTube, and they and they're like, "Before YouTube, what do you mean? <laughs> hasn't yeah, that, hasn't that always mean, been there? <laughs> that's insane. Yeah. <clears throat> I think about it, and I, you know, I was alive before the internet." But I was a kid. I was a baby. Mm-hmm. I uh, I look I look back, and the first cell phone I remember was I remember when the first flip phone came out, and I was still a kid. My dad got a flip phone, you know. That's so for me. I'm in this generation of DVDs and further instant streaming and smartphones and everything you want right at the you know your fingertips. Yeah. And so. I do have to remind myself that there was that wasn't always the case, which it helps me to do when I think about the old school artists, the people that paved the way, people that learned from Snodgrass and all the generations that came after that. They uh, they had to hustle, and I don't have to hustle as hard as they did when they first got into it. I don't have to walk five miles up to a few different shops to try and sell my stuff. I can just post a picture, and I'm really lucky for that. Yeah, it's yeah. We're all jealous of your generation. <laughs> <laughs> At least the guys like you that have actually put the effort in and, and really busted your ass to understand this medium. Because, dude, I mean, you can say I'm a glass blower all fucking day long. I mean, I see it all the time. You know, their friends are hyping them up, and you know, because they can make quote unquote a rig that you sneeze on hardly and the thing falls apart. You know, but you're you're a right. glass blower. You know. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely. To to what extent? That's debatable. Mm-hmm. So, and really it's, that's where the ignorance comes in, you know, through, through, if you're just a buyer and I'm, I'm, ignorance has such a negative connotation, but I just mean you don't have the information. If you come in and you see these two pieces made and they both look kind of cool, but you don't know what a, a clean ring seal looks like and you don't know what, you know, uh, a good wigwag looks like versus a sloppy one or anything like that, you're not going to compare them, you know, uh, really constructively you're not mm-hmm. going to criticize them with the same eye you would as if you were you know informed on the craft <clears throat> so that's why i think a lot of these other artists are out there with their right now they're having some success on instagram selling or auctioning their their pieces that are subpar quality but i think that's just because people want to show support for for people that are out there hustling and doing what they what they like and, and trying to work for themselves and they're less interested in <clears throat> well what went into this uh, is this actual quality is should i teach myself what quality is or does this look cool to me yeah yeah so, man yeah and, that's, and again like I, like i said it's it's our responsibility i personally take it as my responsibility to educate them if they have any questions t- tell them how'd you do that oh okay well here's how i did it you know explain the process give them an appreciation for what you went through mm-hmm. that's how you educate the buyer yeah yeah and that's what i think is such a, cu- a cool new thing with social media and the live streaming is being able to set up in your shop and have one of your customers watching you make their piece like i i hope it gets to a point to where we can do this live streaming to where we can actually hear you know verbal verbalize with our our community i mean i know it might be a little bit overwhelming to have that situation a lot of these voices talking to you at one time but uh right you know just the opportunity to be able to talk you know and and answer questions or to show a certain technique or whatever you know it's 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 a huge opportunity for all of us just to continue to educate and our customer but also learning how to market ourselves and how to talk to our customers because you know as artists a lot of us are introverted and don't want to have a face out in the community per se 
you know, hiding behind yeah, a name that's or a true. moniker. Or Myself and Wings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not easy. Like I mean, even as much as I enjoy being on stage, it's still not easy just to turn my phone on and start talking. But I just do it, and I start talking, and next thing I know, it's been ten minutes, and it's, I've been rambling. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. It's just I just don't think too much about it. Just do it, and it'll happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, dude. So what did I mean, you know, talking about the business side of things and you're talking about budgeting yourself. So do you set a budget for like for your your personal space and your business or do you just kind of have like an overall idea of what your, you know, money in money out kind of deal is? Yeah, at this point, uh, I'm so there's so many things to keep covered and it's just me. I, I, I tend to keep it more qualitative than quantitative. Mm -hmm. How does it feel like, uh, I know how much money I have coming in and going out, and so, and then I have to main, like manage. <clears throat> okay, well, do, is how these expenses that I'm incurring, you know, I need to mitigate which expenses I I incur and don't. So, mostly priorities are glass. So I always need to have money to get oxygen and buy glass when I need it. But I also, you know, you got to have rent paid and stuff like that. So all my money that I have comes from purely selling glass. That's that's my living selling the glass that I make. <clears throat> so I definitely have to budget usually on a monthly basis. How much money, how much money did I make? And y you know what? It's even more like a weekly basis. How much did I make last week? How much can I make this week? And I have to kind of extrapolate or correlate that to how much work it takes me to get that amount of money. Mm -hmm. So and that all that breaks down my, my time budget, my my fiscal budget, my recreational budget, anything like that. It's all broken down by how much money can I make and how long did it take me to make that money. <clears throat> Hell yeah. Yeah, it's smart. It's, it's, and that's what's fun with this too is there's so many different ways of going about, I mean, as an artist, to put your voice in your glass. And then when it comes to the financial side of things, there's lots of ways of going about doing it too. It's like, you know, whatever works for you, it works for you. Right. Yeah. There's so many different ways to accomplish the same task. And some ways are maybe more effective than others. I'm not going to deny that. Mm -hmm. But uh, there's there's a lot of different ways to to accomplish the same thing. And I think that's incredible because I see other artists doing things that ways that I may not have ever considered or ways that I would have not wanted to consider. But then I see them doing it. Usually it happens with artists that I'm around personally, that you know, local artist friends, and I I can learn from them. And I incorporate certain aspects of what they're doing into what I'm doing, and then I in turn change what I'm doing based on inspiration from other people because there are so many other ways to achieve something. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent, man. It's, it's I think having a circle around you. I mean, it's a whole you know circle of five concept, and the influence you have in your life and being able to talk to people openly that are friends of yours or, or in the same realm of space and glass art that you can talk about business and you know how are you running your books or you know whatever because that kind of conversation never happens. I mean, I hear more people bitching about their money than I hear people talking positive about what they're doing with their money, you know, and it's agreed, you know, which I get, you know, but at the same time, it's like, stop bitching about it and make a plan. And you know, it's, it's that plan to fail, fail to plan concept. And if, if you make a plan, then you're going to set yourself up for, for, you know, for winning and not failure. And it's just, it's huge with, with your money wise, do you have separate accounts set up for yourself or is it all just, do you run everything out of one account? Uh, as for now, yeah, it's all running out of one one account. My life and my glass expenses are all kind of intertwined. <clears throat> That's not how I want it running forever. Uh, right now, it's all still very fresh, very new. I'm still just building a brand. I'm just learning things on my own. And within the next year, I'd like to transition into splitting those up to where I have business and I have my personal, mm -hmm. and they're separate. Yeah, it's important to have. It just makes it also easier to keep track of your shit when you're when it comes to like taxes and you know just print out your exactly you know, yeah your all that statements. kind of stuff. I want to keep separated so that that's just very clear. Yeah. As of now, it's just very very new and uh, it's all so complicated. It's, you know, I have to wake up in the morning and deal with. Well, here's the orders I sold yesterday, and to ship those, and I need to work on this, and I need to get this sold today, and I need to try and talk to these customers, and I also want to try and talk to this promoter about doing this, and oh, here's a tournament coming up, I need to plan for that, and there's just so many different things to think about. Just for now, I just take things as they come and prioritize. Yeah. But eventually, and by eventually, I mean within the next year, 
you have me or any other artist, you have to work toward the point of a lot more organization than I'm currently dealing with. Yeah, it definitely helps. It's uh, it 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 just takes like I think the whole concept of taking taking the least amount of time to think about something and just be used to doing it. Like you know, like for instance, I um Tim Ferriss podcast. It's a great show, and he's did a whole episode on morning routines that were just little snippets from uh, some of his top guests that talked about their morning routines and all of them and it was everybody from like a social media marketer to a general in the military they all have the same fucking morning routine every single day they don't have to guess what they're going to be doing in the morning so they can get up they do their routine and by noon or 10 o'clock or whatever time of day it is that morning routine's done and that's like you know eat your food get your workout in take a shower whatever and that you're not using any any brain space and your bandwidth to to do it yeah so when you're done with your morning you know, routine you're on really fire important. yeah it's huge absolutely and you know what when i think about that especially being younger my, my brain tends to think oh that sounds terrible i don't want to live a life of that rigidity no way no thank you but then i have to think think about it even further and something comes to mind that uh bishop randall told me when we were hanging out is uh something he he in, incorporates in his life is is a duality is there's it's nothing is always is or is not things change you can be different versions of yourself at the same time so for instance you don't you don't just have to like rap forever you're not just a rap lover you know you can like country too or you can like you know poetry and novels or or whatever so there has to be a duality so when I think about that rigidity, it's, oh, I don't want to do that morning routine and live my life based on that time block. Well, then I can think about, well, maybe, maybe I can incorporate more with duality. Mm -hmm. Some some point of the day, I am rigid like that. And then at other points in the day, I can be more free-flowing and allow my creative to take over. Because that's, that's the fear for me is if I do get too rigid, what's going to happen to my creative side, that free-spirited, uh, what am I going to do? with this time because it's free i can do i can create anything i want so i yeah. don't want to give that up but i also <laughs> i don't want to be irresponsible my whole life so there has to be that duality you have to find that happy medium that balance yeah and i think too like for myself personally right now like i'm i'm learning what parts of the day do i function better doing what tasks you know and i know like first thing in the morning when i get up i'm my i i have more productive between the hours of like 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. Like those three hours in the morning, I can knock out all my emails, Facebook messages, blah, blah, blah. And those first three hours after getting up and doing my little morning routine, you know, I know my brain space. And then by 10 o'clock, if I was, you know, when I was working at home or even when I'm ever at, at the mouse house doing my thing there, if, you know, right before my shift starts, I'll go turn the shop on. And by the time my morning routine's done, my shop's all hot and ready to go. And then I can go in there and then be creative for six hours or eight hours or, you know, whatever. <clears throat> you know, but it's just by being mindful and understanding again where you work best. I know, you know, after usually about three or four in the afternoon, I don't, I, I'm ready for a fucking break. So usually by three or four o'clock, even at work, I take my first, my first big hour break is usually about four thirty to five thirty, and just because I know that's a good time for me to stop, take a break, catch my breath, get some food, get my energy back and go in again, and then by like seven o'clock, I'm ready to kick some ass. Or if I'm at home, I'm, right, yeah. I'm at 10 o'clock at night. I might work from like 10 till midnight or one in the morning because I know that that time period I'm back to being creative again. But then I'll go there and do a whole different set of work. I'll maybe I'll do a, one piece or I'll make a bunch of production. It's just like you're saying. It's just understanding the duality of who we are and when it works the best at what time of the day. And every day is going to be different. It depends on what time you go to bed. You know, I mean, there, I can get into different routines all day long. And the, I mean, the experts even say, you know, these quote unquote experts. That whether you get up at go to bed uh, at five or get go to bed at ten at night, you should get up the same time every fucking day, and your body just gets used to that every day getting up at the same time. You know, there's because you can't catch up on sleep ever. Right. Yeah. Well, there's also those people out there who, who operate better <clears throat> on less sleep sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> you funny you bring up the experts. Those things experts say don't apply as a broad blanket to everyone. Yeah, exactly. So, <clears throat> what works for one definitely will not always work for another. Yep. Yeah, man. Because I, I do yeah. think it's important for what you're saying is yeah, learn yourself, learn yeah. what works best for you. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's and that's why I say like you know I I, I dig what you did by getting a job and and learning the glass because you had to because it was a job, but you went and still dedicated that time to learn your skill set. And now you can yep. you can Take go seriously. Yeah, and now that you can now you have that skill set, it doesn't take any energy of your brain to know that you had to pull a centered point and how to pull stringers and stuff. You know, that's just muscle memory's there. It doesn't take any effort at all. Because dude, I hate fucking sitting and pulling points. I've I've probably pulled a million in my career, and I still do it. But now I can do it, and I can not really watch the TV show, but I can throw a movie on and just be completely. Not even thinking about what I'm doing on the torch. I'm just going through the you know the yeah. rings and just over. You can and over. let your your body go into autopilot, and you have a centered point. Mm-hmm. And that's then, incredible. Yeah, it is definitely. It? It's it's important to be able to build that up. If you can you can equate it to if you're going to tell a new person like if if they've ever learned to drive stick shift, you know how to drive a standard transmission. Do you remember when you first started how hard that was to not stall out? You remember how hard it was to find that sweet spot in the clutch, and now. <laughs> when the light turns green and you just take off because it's so easy well you need to build that same fundamental understanding with glass that yeah. you do with that yeah it's so true yeah and I, you do know the same thing over and over yeah exactly it's same with like we talk about the music you know if you want to you know you can play the guitar or you can play the fucking guitar and the only way yeah, to really do that exactly. is to practice scales and that's why i don't consider myself to be a quote-unquote musician i can pick up almost any instrument and I can jam and you know, but I'm not really good at reading music. <laughs> yeah, I'm not super. I'm not very proficient in any of the music I play. I'm just okay. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I definitely identify more as a glass artist than a musician, and I think I always will. Yeah, yeah, but I'm sure though, if you dedicated yourself to your music, you would practice the scales, and then you'd be proficient at that. Yeah, you know, you know that's one thing I did learn from from this craft is the process I went through to learning it. And then I, I take that process and relate it to any other craft, whether it be music or, or cooking, baking, or uh, welding, or, or you know, manufacturing, building a structure, anything like that. I think about, well, for someone to be truly good at it, they had to go through a similar process of you know, trial and error, learn by failure, and, and building these fundamentals. So, yeah, I I definitely have learned that if I wanted to do anything else as badly as I wanted to do glass, I would have put in the same amount of work and I'd be just as good as it. Oh, yeah. So that's 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 really important to think about and I learned it firsthand by by doing glasses. I I put in the effort and and I saw the payoff and I still have a long way to go. I still like I said, I'm a baby in the craft and that includes my skill. So I have a long way to go. <clears throat> But I, I learned, you know, I think about a cobbler or any, any of these crafts that take an uh, insane amount of, of skill to do well. But I could do that too if I had taken the same journey, mm-hmm. you know. Yep. But yeah. it, takes, it takes an insane amount of want. It takes an insane amount of effort. And it takes, uh, it takes some gumption. Yeah, and a ton of adversity. <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. I, that's that's the truth right there. Yeah, man. Well, that kind of brings me to the tournament that we're in, seeing the post uh, uh, yesterday on Friday. You know, we had a couple of the artists in the group that either had kilns go down, or one of them got stung by a wasp the day before, and the hand was all fucked up. You know, like there's it's. Oh no! You know, I did not see that. Got yeah. Stung by a wasp. Yeah, Kira. Yeah, <laughs> she was showing a. She put a picture in the. I think it was on the Instagram group. Her hand was all swollen up. So we were kind of maybe it was the Facebook. I don't remember. We were both both of those things. But yeah, she, her hand was all swollen. Yeah. So I hope she was able to, to to get on the torch and make something because I know I've been there, man. I, I got stung on my hand one time out cleaning my pool, and I had to go do some glass work, and it was not easy. It actually the heat oh, hurt my hand more than anything because of the toxins in the in my hand. It was really weird. Yeah, you don't consider that. That is weird. I mean, I definitely consider it with a burn. You know, I get a burn and I go back, and that burn is always much more sensitive to the radiant heat. But mm-hmm. with a sting, that's interesting. Yeah, it's definitely going to be a lot more sensitive, so it, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. uncomfortable! But that is what <laughs> yeah. we deal with as mentors. <laughs> yeah, man, it's interesting. So, you know, it's, and, and this tournament is cool. Uh, those that aren't uh, familiar with it, uh, uh, the kids over at Cherry Glass started this this year, and this, we're in the third round right now. And basically, it's an online social media competition where they have 16 artists they chose. It's a head-to-head competition. 
and each round is a different right, type of type. Style. You know? Yeah, it's, yeah, in a bracket style. Yeah, exactly. It's and it's it's a killer concept because we get to get involved with our communities that follow us, as well as we have judges that are you know voting and you know like I was kind of saying before you know we hit record about you know for the for the one e round is just putting a nine five pinch bat up there for my piece and then seeing how many <laughs> likes I can get on my thing to see if I can get to the second round you know just to to, to talk about it but. You know, I think the cool thing about this is, uh, again, is it's really helping us. It's it's forcing us, in a sense, if we want to be successful at this, to really understand the social aspect of social media and doing the live streaming and posting and doing memes and just all the silly shit that goes along with it. And, you know, you can go to school to learn marketing or you can just fucking do it and understand it and figure it out while you're going along the process. And these kind right, of tournaments, you, can you know. learn by doing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in, in terms that's, of... That's an incredible thing about this process has made me really step outside of my comfort zone man but i'm learning a lot yeah yeah so that being said like how did you go about preparing for figuring out what you're going to make for your piece or did you even did you just like just jump in and say fuck it i'm just going to see what comes out or did you prepare a little bit yeah more or less as far as the design went you know i i did not know what i wanted i knew for sure that i wanted an, an island head in there i wanted something sculpted and i do these little island heads they kind of look like little tiki things mm -hmm. and uh I knew I wanted to incorporate that somehow, but you know the way I work is very whimsical in in such that unless I have a specific custom order or I have something in my brain that I really want to make and get out, I'll just start something and see where it ends up. And that's what I did with this this one e was I just started it and just kept kept going and just through the process. I almost like to describe it as though the glass is talking to me. I let the glass tell me what it wants and I just kept getting ideas and it went from, you know, let me, let me put this donut on top of this Island head and we'll push a bowl in the bottom and that'll be cool. And then once I had that, I said, Oh, I want something penetrating this donut. What can I do from there? And then my brain started turning and I wanted to, uh, incorporate something, an integral, dab straw something i've never seen before just this this whole experience this whole tournament has really helped me push my comfort zone turn some gears in my brain that don't normally turn and absolutely help me grow as an artist so <clears throat> hell yeah really to answer your question and yeah i kind of just went with how i i was feeling i didn't i didn't start off with much of a design in mind nice yeah man i saw this today when we had your picture up there i was like whoa this is a pretty fucking cool idea. I like multifunctional, you know, aspects of, of functional work to be redundant there, but I, you know, I definitely dig the dig the idea of what you're doing. It's it's pretty killer. Oh, thank you. And then you see, uh, you know, the recycler Klein Chillum. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like there's some shit these some of these cats are doing. I'm just like, oh man, because you know, like exactly, you know, you, like, know, you I, think you have a cool idea and you see something like that, and you're like, I'm going home. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, right. I know, and that's oh, kind of how man. I feel about it. Like, like I, I knew where the direction I wanted to go. I just wasn't really sure. And my time is so fucking limited right now, just for my own work. I wasn't even sure if yeah, I was going to be able to, you know, do anything. But stretch. Jesus, so Friday was a long day for me. But uh, you know, I was, I was pretty pumped with what I, how I, what I came up with and came out with. It wasn't like I don't think it's my best work per se, but I think conceptually wise, it was a lot of fun. And like you're saying. It's given me a whole new fucking thought of where I can take this concept that I came up with and run with it with a whole new product line of work. It's like, I like it. Right. It's got your brain thinking in different ways, and I yeah. love it. Yeah. It really excites me about this tournament. Not just about glass work, but about how I want to run my business and market myself and all sorts of different stuff. Yeah, and I think this is a really killer momentum builder because, like, you know, a lot of a lot of the artists in here were worried about only having like a thousand followers. Like, I, you know, I have a little bit over ten thousand, and in the realm of the art community, it's a lot. But there's still like, you know, I, I know plenty of people that have twenty five and thirty and forty thousand followers. But exactly, you know, it, it, my numbers. I think I have a, almost fourteen thousand followers right now, and it feels like a small number compared to some of these other people that I either contend with or look up to, you know, mm -hmm. yeah, it's dude. incredible. And, but there you go. Like, so you've been at this for like almost five years now and I've been at this for 18 and you have like 4,000 more followers than I do. <laughs> right. You know? and it's, it has absolutely nothing to do with either of our, our merit or abilities with glass, but everything to do with, uh, marketing and yep. a lot, a lot of luck 
and circumstances. Yeah, and understanding how Instagram works, and then being able to keep up with their changes and and pivot yeah. and you know all that kind of stuff. Because I know I'm guilty for not posting for a couple of days, and if you don't post for a couple of days, you get lost in the fucking weeds. Yep, that's true, man. I, and you know, even on the the opposite end of that spectrum, if you post too much, people will get turned off to you. Mm-hmm. And I learned that, you know, firsthand from my own personal experiences. I'll post five or six times a day, and then I'll just stop getting as much activity. And people just don't care so much when they feel like you're spamming them. Right. Yeah. Or, exactly. Like, or if they don't care if they feel like you're not present at all. Mm-hmm. They go on your page and they see your last post was three days ago or even worse, you know, a week ago or last month and they're just totally turned off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's such a weird, just the whole setup of the way things are. And, you know, even if when you like, you like somebody's stuff and then that's all you see in your feed is their shit. <laughs> yep. Yeah, yeah, who knows what, what this algorithm has done for people's feeds and what comes up in it. I don't even know. Yeah. I can absolutely say that I've seen a decrease in my activity for certain things due to it mm-hmm. or since it's been established, but I can find ways to combat that. You know, going live is so great. You know, post something on your feed, say you're going live, and then go blow glass live for a few hours or even, you know, 30 minutes, whatever. Get people coming and watch, and that way they want to come see your feed again later that week. And they'll tell their friends or anything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Do you have your, your Instagram set up as a business page? I do, yes. Yeah, cool. That's smart. Yeah, it's, it's killer, man. Yeah. You can go on there and see all your insights and times of days and exactly. know, demographics. Like, you got useful information. Yeah, it's huge. Being like, okay, well, I posted this yesterday. I thought it might do well, but it only got 130 views. I wonder why that is. Mm-hmm. I mean, it had time, time of day what day it was, all sorts of stuff. And you can go and kind of see some of that, that data when your Instagram set up as a business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and those are the kind of things that, that we all have to pay attention to. And, you know, it brings me back to, like, getting into a budget and understanding things. And when I worked at Subway, for, I did that shit for seven years. And probably the biggest thing I learned there besides the production side of things, because we did production making sandwiches, but was the business side and ordering, like, materials and understanding, like, okay, we're getting low on meatballs. Do we need to order more than we usually would, or are we going to sell as many this this month? You know, kind of thing, and being able to look at records from the previous year's sales and understanding, okay, here's a potential forecast of what this year is going to look like, and then you can prepare a way ahead of time. Once you get to a point to where you have a set of numbers that you can compare, and it's, you know, a year isn't always, you know, going to help you determine. It can give you an idea, but like. Once you start doing it, and then you can really spend three or four years of have data in like an Excel spreadsheet with little graphs and shit, and really see, okay, here's my peak months. I needed to make sure I'm stocked up this month, or how can I increase right. this month, make this month better, or this month's going to cost me five thousand dollars to work. I got to make ten grand so I can pay my bills too. You know, like all that kind of shit. So it's all that is just totally crucial. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Whether it's in glass or running a restaurant or a retail business or whatever, you yeah. have to be able to read and and react to that data yeah and it's all real simple business 101 stuff but it's stuff that it's easy to just say oh fuck it i'm just gonna live off these pipes i mean i dude i had that mentality i'd have 20 bucks in my pocket i go buy a fucking quarter bag and roll like four blunts and i'm now i'm broke and it's like oh i'll just go sell a pipe and then i don't sell the pipe and then i'm hungry for two days you know it's like st- right. stupid mentality stuff and it and also has I, you know i was saying earlier spent my first year doing stuff just like that 100 mm. yeah. percent. yeah it's and it's easy to do and it's it's also a maturation thing you know that goes along as yeah. us human beings but also in this industry as well you know the maturation of this industry and we're getting into our teenage phase now and we're still you know it's kind of like a 16 year old girl you know Kind of throwing temperatures here so. and there, <laughs> <laughs> and I know what that's about because yes. I have an eighteen-year-old now. So. <laughs> oh man, bless you! I don't have kids myself, but I, uh, I have two sisters, and we definitely put our parents through the ringer. Oh yeah, yeah. In the teenage years, man, it's it's incredible. Yeah, mine was a little hellion, so I knew what to look They're out little for. Little shitheads, man. I was a little shithead. I still am. I'm still got a lot of maturing to do. I <laughs> <laughs> hey, dude, it's all good. Enjoy it in your twenties, bro. Because I, I'm glad I'm out of my twenties. Because I, my twenties were dumb. You know, I did some dumb shit. You know, I learned a lot of stuff. And I, my kid was, my daughter was born at the time. And like, I, you know, 
but I still I made some stupid fucking decisions, and a lot of it was just based on my dick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll do that kind of shit, man. It's terrible. Yeah, it's nice being <laughs> 40 now. Like my libidos, you know. I don't get me wrong. I still have a pretty strong, you know, drive, but like. My, it's not in control of you. <laughs> dude, yeah, it is not like leading me out like a fucking carrot dangling out there in the world anymore. Yeah, it's uh it can definitely get it can get it can get crazy when you're in your 20s and yeah. you, I have to remind myself like, well, be in control, man. <laughs> yep. Be be okay with being young and making mistakes and fucking up. Don't hold don't kill yourself over it. You absolutely need to learn. Yeah. Hold yourself accountable, but, you know, just Move on. Don't dwell too much. Yeah, two philosophies I wish I would have stuck. Like I, I was told at a young age, that I wish I would have stuck with. And I can't say wish because I, I wouldn't take my my daughter is like my rock. Like I would. I don't even know if I'd be blowing glass honestly because when my wife was ex wife was pregnant with her is when I met my master at the Renaissance Festival kind of thing. Like I don't, I don't know where I'd be without oh, her right, in my right. life, you know, kind of stuff. But like, right. I was told two things as a kid and was like, one of the things about drugs is if it can kill you on the first time or you're addicted the first time, don't ever do it. And, yes, that was know. a great way to look at it. And the second one was keep your dick in your pants unless you're pulling it out to take a piss. <laughs> I haven't heard that one yet. That's a good one. Yeah. <sighs> so, yeah. There you go. Yeah, man. Definitely, it's important to, to keep in mind uh, we're all going to make mistakes, especially when you're my age or younger. We fuck up. We don't always think with the future in mind. And... uh you learn from your mistakes and you talk to other people who have been down that road before you. You can mm-hmm. learn from others' mistakes too. I mean, that kind of brings me, not that these were mistakes at all. These were actually <clears throat> huge advancements in our community, but the people that paved this industry for me, I wouldn't be where I am without, you know, these, these big name guys who started 10, 15, 20 years ago being taught by their mentors you know, people that I look up to, like uh, Banjo or Bishop or Slinger or uh, Laceface or you name it, man. Snake. Uh, lots of lots of these artists that are, they paved the way and they <clears throat> they made mistakes, I'm sure, but it's uh, I really have to appreciate people that went through it before me and talk to them get experiences from them don't yeah. try and go through life as a as a one man island yeah exactly and that kind of brings me to the whole mentorship you know topic like you brought up like having a mentor you know whether it's in glass blowing or just life in general it's such a huge thing to have someone older than you that's been there done that and wrote the book and can if, as long as they're obviously a professional in a sense and semi successful in what they're doing and you look you know, they could teach you some things. Yeah. You know, you don't want just some fucking crackhead on the side of the road that's older than you teaching your life. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, they need to have some sort of ground to stand on. Yeah. Yeah, it's huge. And getting involved in mastermind groups like that, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's like there's and these are the little things I want to develop in this com- in the community on the podcast and like I gotta one day find the time to do it. But it's 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 such a huge opportunity and I think having these groups like this tournament that we're in you know we're all we're all kind of laughing saying I'm not sure if my piece is going to live up to the expectations as we're all posting our pictures but we're all at least in there talking to each other and asking questions and helping each other out you know it's it's such a huge thing there's no trolls in there talking shit telling you your stuff sucks yeah I think it's really great when you have everyone open like that in a uh, in a forum when, when everyone's positive, like like they are, and usually that's how it is, especially in this glass industry that I've noticed. When when everyone's trying to communicate with each other, there's there's a lot of constructive stuff happening. Yeah. So that's that's been really great for this entire process is for me to learn because I'm I'm pretty I keep to myself a lot. I don't talk to a ton of other artists outside of the ones that I know, and so when I can be introduced to new artists like this process has done. And have a lot of them say the same thing, like, "Oh man, I'm, you know, I'm kind of worried about this person." And it's like, really, you are? Because I'm worried about you. And it's like, we all kind of help humble each other, or we all help level our playing field in some way or another when it is an intimate 
group like that relatively you know there are mm-hmm. 16 of us it's not like we've all taken each other aside and been like hey what's up but i'm just comparing it to you know like a message board or something yeah yeah exactly there's just no personability at ever so here we, we kind of can be more involved and i do appreciate what that has to offer for the paradigm of the tournament and the group and what I have to learn from the whole process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's where I'm at too. Like I'm enjoying what I'm learning from this. You know, that's why I wanted to ask about the preparation thing because like I sort of prepared for it and did some sketches and some ideas and then I was always like second guessing myself like, well, you know, and then I was had to be like, you know, I've got a three hour window of opportunity to do this thing and I got to spend this time and do it. So I did and that's, you know, I have my result and I can't take it back now. You know, it's just, yeah, it's just and I think it's it. great to ask those questions, be comfortable enough to not only ask the questions but then answer them. You mm-hmm. know, so I'm, I love when when I can ask a question like that and someone will give me their process. And everyone is different. Most people do things different than this one standing next to them will do. So I like to hear <clears throat> how other people will do it. And sometimes things people tell me they won't work for me. It's, uh, other times they will. So stuff like this really just makes me appreciate being part of a community of like-minded people hell yeah i think you know to be successful in anything you have to be open for criticism and open to be able to to make changes and you know it seems like you've been able to do that as you know starting off where you started and being able to take i'm sure lots of fucking criticism when you're first starting you know seeing your stuff go through quality control and you're getting you know a 30% return on stuff that's first quality, you know, that could be a kick in the nuts. It could be completely, you know, Oh yeah. You know, Absolutely. It, it, you know, make your whole day suck. But then for you, it probably was the motivating factor to make it so that your percentages on your first quality were better and better and better every single time. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when, you know, I'm, I'm young. I understand I have uh, a, a large ego and a lot of it has to do with my youth. And I, once I can get past that, and appreciate what someone was trying to teach me or tell me. I, I, it is great. It is great for me to have that kind of constructive criticism for me to learn and, and improve myself. But I'd be lying if I didn't say that sometimes when I'm faced with that, my youth takes over and I'm like, well, 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 fuck you. Fuck you for telling me that. Like, I'll just blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, I have to like, wait, hold on. You're just being, annoyed because someone told you something that you know is true and then you get over that and then you can internalize the information and improve yourself mm-hmm. but you know, absolutely it's it's worth mentioning that <laughs> you have to make the effort to improve even if someone is going to help you improve yeah exactly yeah and i think too it has to go on the other side of the spectrum of those that are criticizing have to know how to properly criticize and not be a dick agreed <laughs> yep you know, they have to you know, know you know, being part of the industry is important. I get lots of criticisms from, from people who have never blown glass a day in their life. And some of those criticisms, and just they're almost laughable. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, <laughs> you're, you're telling me this because you just don't know the process. And other ones are absolutely valid. So yeah. you, you, you can't ignore them. You have to take them as they come. Yeah, exactly. You got to be like a duck and let that water just run out of her back and not let it get to you. Because yeah. yep. it's easy to, to you it's know. It's true. Besides being our own worst critic, you know, like I, like I was saying with my piece for this tournament, it's like, you know, I'm criticizing the hell out of this thing, but I could bring it to a show and, or even like people I've sent pictures of it to just to get some feedback and they're all like blowing it up, you know, and I'm asking for a true, honest feedback and I haven't gotten any negative feedback on it. I seem to be the only one being negative about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as, as is the case with most of us honest artists, when we're, when we're truthful with ourselves, we're so negative about everything that's wrong with the piece, yeah. nothing that's right with it. Yeah, it's so funny. And I think that's like, you know, part of the the dynamic of Instagram and social media and, you know, like Jeff DeMarco who does amazing photography for the pipe community for artists out there and you see these some you know, some of these pictures are fucking amazing and it's like, damn, I would definitely buy that piece. But then you see it in person and it's like a third of the size you thought it was and may have a couple flaws here and there that you know yeah. are obvious once you see it in person. You know. Yep. But, I I've definitely seen it and I don't think there is an artist a glass artist, maybe even regular artist, but glass artist for sure, that's not guilty of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but you know, a lot of that has to do with uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, now. I'm not taking that that 
statement in the right direction. A lot of that helps with people seeing something and then they they themselves raise their own standards. They raise the bar of what's possible because they see something in a photo that may represent it in a better light than it actually is. So there is something positive to be about that, but I definitely agree with you. I've seen plenty of amazing photos where the piece looks great. And then I see the piece in real life and uh, fall short of expectation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I, 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 I definitely like when that happens because it makes me feel better about my stuff. <laughs> yes, it definitely <laughs> helps me realign my reality a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, oh, okay, I, I get it. Now I see. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. And it's just, you know, the whole eye of the beholder. I mean, I can come up with every fucking cliche under the sun today, but, you know, it's yeah. each, you know, each person's you perspective. You compare it to photos of models, man. You, just, you, you, you look at a photo of an of a, a underwear model or anything, and then you look at her in real life, there's always going to have been something that made that photo look better than the actual real life thing. Mm. So. There can be that. You can equate it to the same thing with the glass. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even especially when I'm trying to sell something, I will take a photo of something in its best light, at its best angle. And unless I'm putting up a 360 degree video, I'm not going to go out of my way to show the flaws of the piece. <laughs> well, see, there you go, man. Your generation in 360 videos. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, it's just standard. My whole, my whole, Glass career, I've had the opportunity to, to post up a video of my stuff. Yeah, it's so fucking crazy. So when you took your pictures today, like or yesterday, or whenever you took them, like what what's your process for fo- for photographing? Do you try to like use a station or a, sta- a, a booth, or do you go out in nature? Like what do you do? Yeah, well, it it depends because you know when I put something online, whether it's an auction or a piece available for sale. I have to think about how uh, it's going to look in people's feeds. Will Instagram put it out there for people to see or are they going to think it's something they won't want to see so it won't come up in people's feeds so uh i'll try and pepper in a lot of nature photos a lot of stuff with green a lot of stuff with plants but then i'll also try and do some nice uh you know photo box pictures i try and do a little bit of both as well as video i like to put in a 360 video of usually every piece i make nice do you do like a like on a turntable or is the, is the camera set up for the 360 uh, usually I'm just real lazy about it and, and spin it around in my hand. Um, you know why? Is because I spent some money on a Lazy Susan earlier this year, and it was a piece of shit. I returned it. And I asked Ryan Fit about his Lazy Susan, and he says he's been looking for a good one for years. He can't seem to find a good one. So uh, <laughs> I just decided uh, I'm not going to really invest too much in something like that. I'll just I'll just be... Uh, low budget about it for now. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, the one I had gotten was from Bed Bath and Beyond. It was wo- like a wood one, and it had like the ball bearing, you know, so it re- it moved real easily. <clears throat> and uh, I it's at my ex's house now, but um, I use like their twenty five dollar off coupon gimmick that you can get. I think I paid like twenty five bucks for it or something like that. But it's it's nice because it's it's w- really really wide. So you can, oh great! You know you can put like a cloth on it or some shit, you know, type of thing, and you can spin it, and not have your hand in the picture. Like I have like one of those little solar power display spinner gimmicks, you know, type of thing. And I was trying right, to yeah. it, trying to use it today for my piece, but it's like only if it's too heavy because this thing's like solar power, and I don't have it. The, the even like the battery com, uh, compartment for it, so I don't know if it's broken. It doesn't work. So I'm trying to get this thing to spin, and it just didn't want to spin for my video today it's like it's annoying as shit you know and i was like yeah. i was gonna go outside and take pictures and it's raining today so it's like okay i had to take some shit pictures but whatever the same thing happened with me no sunshine today otherwise i definitely would have posted an outside photo but i just decided to uh send over some some photo box photos of my piece so people can vote on that yeah 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 i'm actually curious to see how this whole voting thing goes i notice i don't know if you noticed but they're the uh the Terminal of Fire, they had two different variations of their posting of, of the at, you know, and the one that they had had a longer underscore, it was like tournament, and then like a long underscore of, and then the short underscore of fire. And their normal page that we're on every, all the time, they're both of the underscores are the same width. So I don't know if they're going to use that other one for just the voting page. I don't, I don't know. It's weird. 
Oh, like, right. Okay. So I didn't even notice there were two different ones. Yeah, because I clicked on it and it says, like, you know, user not found, no post yet. So I don't know. Huh. Kind of curious. Well, I suppose we'll see when they put it up, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we will. And this is going to go out next week. So this will be, uh, this will go out mid second round, I guess. So, oh, right on. Well, I mean, fingers crossed one or both of us will still be in it at yeah. that point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, man, that being said, if you if you don't go past this round, are you going to stay in the group and chit-chat and stuff, or are you just going to move on? Yeah, I mean, definitely, I still feel like there's a lot to be gained from it as long as <laughs> until I pretty much get kicked out or the, uh, you know, the tournament ends mm-hmm. for this round. But, uh, no, I, I, I think there's a lot to learn and a lot to a lot of more relationships I can build, especially with these sponsors. I haven't really talked to many of them yet. So yeah, same I think here. if I could reach out, talk to them, see what kind of relationships <laughs> I can establish. That's what it's all about, you know, is, is that networking, whether mm-hmm. it's just a quick little hello. That way, when you're at an event or anything like that, which you should be going to, if you're a glass artist, you should be going to events, whether they're... See, I myself haven't made it to the big ones, like Champs or Age, but I go to little local shows as much as I can, particularly out in Long Beach at the Functional Art Gallery. Um, there was a root show that Bishop put on with uh, Jason Burris and a few other artists, and uh, that gallery has put on a few shows since, and every single time I'll get out there and go to the show, and I'll mingle with people that are in the industry, and they'll know my face, they'll get to know me, and it's just so important to make those little connections so that down the road, people know you yeah man it's so important because like back in when i was first doing this you know like a year into it i would same thing i would go to like the local art shows and we had like maybe three of us in the area that were making pipes i mean maybe in florida alone there maybe been six or seven of us back you know that were making pipes so wow. you know it was hard imagine i know right tell me about it. <laughs> well just to put things in perspective when i first signed on to glasspipes.org i was one of the top for or one of the first 20 people to join it and was in like the holy t- shit and was like one in like the top i was in like the top five of the of the hundred artists for on and off wow. for like the first year and a half and then i got lost in the weeds yep and stuff started booming didn't it <laughs> yeah yeah totally yeah because that's that initially started once the whole operation pipe dreams kicked in and that became like a protest of like you know this is a gallery this isn't a place to sell your work you know fuck you the government type bullshit yeah and then look at it now. It's pretty pretty cool stuff. But uh, but yeah, man. When it I is. you know when I first started getting out there, I would go to all these glass events or or art shows in general and go seek out the glass artists that were there, and I'd shake my hand, introduce myself to them. I mean, I, I introduced myself to the same four people probably twenty times over ten years, and they until they got yeah, to know my. Yeah, you'll have to do that. Yeah, yeah. But it was funny because most of them were all furnace workers, so they still had this stigma against lamp workers of a male class in my 20s as they assume I'm a pipe maker and obviously I was but I was also making pendants and jewelry and stuff at the time too yeah and I didn't come out saying I was a piper but they kind of like turned their nose up at me at first for like probably a couple years you know yeah man that was a real odd thing for me to learn about when I got into it because it was already past that but learning that the (laughs) the furnace workers had a really negative stigma toward the pipe makers was interesting for me it was interesting. So learning, like for instance, when, when Paco and Slinger went and uh, dressed up in their suits and threw down at uh, where was it Corning? Uh, no, it was back in. Uh, <clears throat> they had it in the Degenerate Art movie, but yeah, yeah, yeah. They, I don't know if that was a DFO or one of those things that did that. Well, no, it was. It was a. It was. I can't remember what it was for, but they 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 entered the first pipe into that competition. It okay. wasn't a pipe making competition. But they entered a pipe into it, <laughs> so that was that was the beginning of it. You could you can look it up. Um, Y'all have to. It's it's back when because because they they wore really nice suits. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Glasses and stuff. Yeah, I can just, totally see the picture in my head of those guys. Yep. Yeah, Paco and Slinger throwing down behind the torches with their suits on. There's a picture out there floating yeah. around. You know, and that's from that event. Speaking of Paco, I think he's one of the most underrated, underappreciated artists in our industry. He's he's one of those cats that has just been so be outside more. the box, bro. Like his work is. His... I don't think there's enough people out there that realize that Paco and Slinger are related. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. 
Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's and, crazy. And they have totally different style of work. You know, like they're totally their Absolutely. own their own people. You know, it's it's interesting. Yeah, very cool to me. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I agree. And that whole that whole Northeast Philly group of cats up there, like you know, they have their own awesome community. But there has been some incredible fucking artists that have come out of that community, or that are still yeah. there. Yeah, blows me away. And I, I have a massive appreciation for the, especially the Philadelphia artists, but any of those East Coast artists, like. Uh, they're the ones who bring the heat. You know, they're the ones who, when I look back, when I first think about what Glass started off as like amazing, whoa, this is this. It was those those artists over there on the East Coast, mm-hmm. and they were throwing down. They had their own community. It was like they were all developing their own techniques and kind of sharing their secrets with each other on a very personal level, and that's really incredible for me to learn about. Yeah, and it seems too like that's where the whole finding your voice and a character of some sort really began. You know, like the West yep. Coast was all about the tech. I mean, don't get me wrong, man. Like the West Coast was like that was the beginning of all of it for us. But like, you know, they were the pattern, you know, take make a hammer bubbler, but like have some just incredible work like Jason Lee's wigwags, like, you know, all that stuff that was going into the work. Right. And then the Philly Cats and the cat, you know that that whole group, they started getting into more of the, like the character style, sculptural, functional work, you know, type of stuff. And it's it definitely you can tell personality wise too, just in terms of environment. It's a whole different type of scene. And I don't know if that's what influenced it or not, but you know, it definitely seems in a sense like some of those cats up in the Northeast were had a glass educational background or some kind of art background, where the West Coast cats didn't necessarily have that. They were all just you know, off the dead tour, learning the glass pipes and really blowing the <laughs> right. fucking shit up, you know, just on their own. It's weird, you know, and I'm, and I'm not just like throwing everybody into one ball here, but just in terms of a generalized spectrum of things, it was definitely... Exactly, yeah, know. just to, just to basically generalize it. Yeah, and then we have <clears> this, <throat> this little select group of us in Florida that were like the redheaded stepchilds of the industry, <laughs> you know. Yeah, you this, said there were what, like maybe seven of you in the whole state back then? Yeah, it seemed like it, you know, that were, that were actual pipe makers i mean there might have been more right. but you know we didn't know each other at the time and now there's probably fucking 400 of us i mean i really don't know numbers wise but yeah there's there's too many to count at this point yeah yeah but it's been fun man growing up in the industry here because it's 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 finally gotten to a point in florida where the florida class collector can appreciate what's going on the this, this laws and rules here are just so fucking backwards and a lot of the collectors I mean, were like either north florida or south florida and then their orlando started to blow up and now it's just all over the damn place yeah, and a lot of that has to do with uh, people taking it as their responsibility to educate people, mm-hmm. educate and bring other people into the in, into the culture. So uh, I think that's great when I see other artists out there that they're not just in it to blow some glass and sell their stuff and make their money. They also want to be part of the culture. They want to be involved. They want to go to events. They want to <clears throat> educate uh, anyone they can. They're not trying to withhold information. That's I think that's a really big part of what this this whole movement has become, is a lot of people finding other like-minded and kind-hearted people, and not being afraid to just share ideas. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty amazing, man. And 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 the giving back too now as well, which I think is is awesome. That is amazing. Yeah. Seeing the the like what just went down with the Michigan project. Yeah. Them and them giving all that money to the arts for for schools in in Michigan is that's incredible. You know, I wouldn't be where I am had I not had a music program in my school growing up paid for. So mm-hmm. for them to to think that process through and put an effort toward making money and giving back to that community, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, it is. Yeah, and that being said, man, that's why I wanted to bring it up. Like, have you? have you like thought about you know down the road like what you could do in a sense or you know take the success of your business I have a little bit you know just just as much as I really can only being in it for a couple years eventually I'd like to as far as making some sort of difference with my my glass I I want to bring people into the culture more I'd, I'd like to have some sort of place you know I'd, I'd call it a school but maybe it's not a school it's just a place where people can come and learn and be exposed to the craft maybe for the very first time but they don't have to worry about you know all the overhead that comes with that they can just come in and pay for a class and learn about the culture 
maybe make something or see something made. And um, eventually I'd like to be like an all inclusive thing. There's flame working, there's cold shop, there's hot shop, there's furnace work, there's everything. And someone can come in and be exposed to the culture of the craft. And then they learn, wow, there's people here that don't have to go work flipping burgers or they don't have to work in a cubicle or they don't have to do something. They, they were able to take this craft and make money on it. Because there's a lot of different ways to make money with glass. You can make jewelry, you can make pipes, you can make all sorts of collectibles or keepsakes, anything you want. There's, or you can make uh, more functional stuff like goblets or anything. So don't forget the dildos. <laughs> don't forget the dildos. Those were <laughs> uh, industry saver for some people. Back oh, it did it? Was, it was for me. <laughs> so all that kind of stuff. I would like a place. Uh, to be able to expose the general public to that crap. Yeah. So eventually that's the goal I want to work toward is to, to be able to work toward um, opening a place like that one day down the road to where people can come in and get hands-on experience with it and feel it and, and maybe fall in love with it and then go and take that, you know, their own direction. Hell yeah, man. That's killer. Fuck yeah, dude. Well, I think that's a, uh, a good enough for us to take a quick break here and thank our sponsors. And then uh, we'll come back and it'll be time for us to crash a kiln. Hell yeah. I like it. This segment of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Zen Dude Fitness. Lose 10 pounds this month by joining the Zen Dude Fitness four-week jump rope fat loss challenge. Brandon and Dan will take you on a guided journey towards becoming the best you. Get fit, have fun, and find new ways to eat healthy while still enjoying the sweeter side of life. Just takes 20 to 30 minutes a day and no gym required. For more info and to sign up for the free four-week challenge, go to wiseguymedia.com forward slash zen dude fitness. That's wiseguymedia.com forward slash zen dude fitness. Awesome. All right, man, we're back. Quick break. So uh, the Crash in the Kiln round consists of seven questions. If you want to give me a 30 to 60 second answer for each question, and you can expound upon them as we always do. And the first question I always like to ask is, if there's any living glass artist you haven't worked with yet and you want to, who is it and why? Uh, that's a difficult question only between two people. It would be between Bishop or Banjo. Okay. Uh, the reason for that is the same reason for both of them is because they are very kind-hearted people with a lot of knowledge and and a lot of humility to share. I feel like I can learn a lot not just from their glass but from their how they choose to go through life. So I've just met those two people personally, spent some time with them, and uh, <clears throat> absolutely feel like there there's some artists that I look up to. Yeah, it's good stuff. What are your uh, top five favorite colors in glass? Oh, that's right now. It's hard to answer with all these new hot colors that are coming out, but I really <laughs> like uh, slime, you know, old school, just classic slime. That's probably one of my favorites. I really like heavy blue stardust. Um, <clears throat> I really like, Pomegranate, that's a great one to work with. You can layer that and all sorts of stuff. It's just a really stable color. One of my favorites to work with right now uh, is peach because it's beautiful and it's also really nice to work with. But my all-time favorite glass color since the beginning of time and until now is experimental green because of the range you can achieve with it. Hell yeah. Yeah, it's a fun color. I remember when it first came out, there were a couple batches that were like super sketch, like full check from top yeah, to bottom. That was you know. <laughs> I heard about those. Yeah. I wasn't in it by then, but I heard about when Experimental Green first came out. It was definitely bad news for the first couple batches. Yeah, it was interesting stuff. Yeah, but it's a it's a fun color for sure. <clears throat> yeah, it'll still do it. You know, you, you deeply encase that stuff. It can check on you. Yeah, yeah, that's fucking for sure. So uh, here's the question: Is uh, what's your worst injury in the studio? Oh, worst injury in the studio is definitely a third degree burn I got on my my uh, 
lower torso, my belly pretty much. I was working on a pipe, and uh, I was at the, the point where you're, you want to shape your head. So I had the whole, a good third portion of this molten, and I was ready to puff into it. And this was my first year being set up on my own, and it, uh, it fell off my punty. And it was molten hot, and it fell off my punty right into my lap. Mm. And uh, it hit my stomach and rolled down my leg and then burned all my clothes. And it gave me just this huge third-degree burn right on my stomach. And uh, <clears throat> it's about the size of a tennis ball. Jesus. As, as far as, you know, width goes. And so that was definitely the worst burn I ever got, but still not bad enough for a hospital visit. <laughs> Yeah, man, it sucks. Were you wearing a shirt? I was. Burned right through that shirt. Yeah, Jesus. Yeah, yeah it, it sucks. was glowing red. It, it had to have been, you know, at least 2,000 degrees. Yeah, no fun, man. I had a marble one time. I get. I had a, one of my friends who used to come over to my house and give me a massage. And uh, my studio was out back in my... I had like a 10 by 10 shed just for the shop, like a little barn style gimmick. And there was a huge oak tree in my neighbor's yard that covered the, it was like a perfect space. I was always in the shade, you know, and whatever. And my friend that would give me massages, she'd come over and do it outside right there on the, under the oak tree. And uh, yeah, there was a day I would have, nice. yeah, it was killer. Well, with one of the days we did a trade. So I was like, I made her a nice marble and I mean, I'm talking like inch and a half, probably something like around there. And I was just wearing my board shorts. I was still all oiled up from the massage and that fucking thing came off the punny as I was going to switch punnies to make it nice and round and it whatever it rolled towards me and not even thinking about it I just quickly used my hip to bump it real quick to stop it and it burnt me but it also burnt me like a fucking grease fire because I was covered in massage oil so it just like spread dude I had the most fucked up burn pattern on my side of my belly I still got a pretty good scar from it that's horrible. Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so if you ever uh, get a massage, take a shower before I go to the studio. <laughs> you learned that the hard way. I definitely yeah. want to think about that. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, man. And, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about lavender oil being really good for burns and and take, helping take the pain out and helping your skin heal, too, from it. And I do recommend using it, but wait until that burn is cooled off. Cause that it, makes sense. It'll do the same. I had the same thing, man. I'm like, I'm going to put some lavender on there real quick and then it spread like a fucking grease fire. It hurt so bad. Ugh, that's you know? horrible. Because the core of those burns are what's really the hottest of all of it. You know, it sucks. Right. Yeah, I've had a graphite burn before, and those those stay hot for a long time. Oh, dude, I can't. I, I burn myself on my tools more than anything in the shop. Yeah. Whether it's my L marber <laughs> or a bull push or some shit, you know. It's crazy. Yeah, nowadays I, I don't get really bad burns. I'll still burn myself, but it's quick and it doesn't, you know, it's like, oh, that was hot. Okay, I'm fine. Yeah, it still hurts every time, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just, it's just the length of how long it hurts. <laughs> yeah. Although you notice, I don't know if you notice, when I'm in the kitchen or something like that, and I'm dealing with like under 300 degrees and I burn myself, I kind of chuckle. I'm like, yeah. oh, that wasn't that bad. <laughs> Dude, I grabbed the pan of brownies out of my oven one time, not even think about it with my bare hands. I just like reached in there and gra- I was like, what the fuck am I doing? You know? So, yeah. Didn't even think about it. I put, them, yeah. put them, I put them on my stove and I'm looking at my hand. My hand's all burnt and I'm like, what a fucking dumbass. But I just, I just being used to dealing with heat all the time. I don't know what I was thinking, but I haven't done that since. I was, maybe I was just, I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, I'm, that's the first time I've heard that one. Yeah, hey, long day, I guess. So, uh, yeah. So let's see. What uh, in the studio? Do you watch TV? Uh, listen to the radio, or do you have both going? Not at the same time, but you know, alternating, or maybe uh, at the same time. Yeah, in the studio, I. I use headphones because I, I share a shop uh, space with my shop mate and I don't want to force him to listen to stuff I listen to. So I'll use Bluetooth headphones and I'll listen to usually a playlist I have on Spotify or the Joe Rogan Experience podcast on Stitcher or I'll put some show on the background in Netflix and it's always playing on my phone while it's sitting on the charger. So Hell yeah. usually one of those three things is what I have going on while I'm working. Nice. Hell yeah, man. Let's see. If you could describe the sound of glass cracking in one word, whether it's uh, metaphorically speaking or an emotional response or literally what it sounds like, uh, what, what would you call it? Or what word would you use? Uh, let's see. Or statement. One word? I think the first thing that comes to my mind is panic. Okay. 
when I hear that tink, I panic. <laughs> but it's only for a second. Yeah, that's because cool. I've gotten to the point where I've learned to fix shit. I haven't, I haven't had something crack on me where I haven't been able to fix a crack in a long time. Hell yeah. I've had to learn how to put it down into the kiln and just let it soak. <laughs> yeah, see, as soon as I hear that tink, I get myself this really big, bushy, annealing flame, and I just put it at the back of that, and I'll just float it in that flame for three to five minutes, and then I'll start to go in and look where I need to repair it and start to start to go in on it. But Yeah, I guess I do the same thing. As soon as I hear tink, yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> Cause Panic, a lot of it, man. Oh yeah, yeah man. Because a lot of it depends on also like how long it's been out of the flame or the kiln, and also where it's at too. So yeah, because you definitely a lot of it has to do with that. Yeah. If I hear some of my like tubing prep crack, I'll usually just you know, if I can work the crack out of it so it's not in there anymore. If mm. it's just prep, I'll just let that shit crack and just just heat the shit out of it. But if it's a piece that I'm almost done with and it's got it just cracked, you know, you have to finesse it. <clears throat> yeah, I think. But I've had pieces where I'm 90 percent of the way done, and it'll crack, and I'll I'll have to spend 30 minutes doing a repair on it, but it'll come out. Yeah, yeah. I think my worst, or actually my least favorite cracks, I should say, are uh, little checks on down stems. Yeah, it gives you so much work. <laughs> it's such a kick in the nuts. Man, I <clears throat> I don't think I've had that happen yet. Yeah, it'll happen from either using cold tweezers or a quick check flash, you know, kind of thing where you didn't really heat it up properly. Yeah. But usually it's from a cold tool, like when if you go to put it in there with using a pair of tweezers or some shit, it's usually that. That'll be your downfall, anyone's downfall. Yep, I learned the hard way. Cool. A lot of times I've actually kept a pair of tweezers on top of my kiln just to keep them warm, you know. Um, but even like, you know, like if you have a finish tool with a pair of like the Kevlar wraps on a tongs kind of gimmick, those Kevlar wraps, just the, the room temperature can cause your glass to crack on them on you. Yeah, you still need to preheat those before you touch your glass. Yeah. You know, actually, I'll ha I hang mine sometimes on the handle for my guillotine door for my kiln. So that way, the, oh, that's a good idea. you know, and the heat just coming out of the kiln just kind of keeps them warm in a sense. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like using those tongs. They scare me. So just because I don't trust myself not to accidentally lose grip on the piece and they'll slip. Mm -hmm. But I got – I have uh, – I don't know if you've heard of them, the steelhead glass uh, claw tools. I bought that, and that holds pretty much everything I ever make. Hell yeah. Does it have like an angular kind of tooth to it, per se? Yeah, it's got like uh, those, they they kind of wrap around on the, on the, the tip, so where they, they grab a rounded object, or even anything with a rim. Right. And they open nice and wide, but then they also close really small. So I can finish carb caps with it, or I can finish huge tubes that have really big feet on them. Nice. Hell yeah. Uh, let's see. Do you have any glass blowing theme tattoos? No, I don't. Not yet. Eventually I will, but I'm only four years into it. I need to give myself some more, some more time before I ink myself up. And yeah. that's just me personally. You know, and I, it's not like I have anything against anyone who does it sooner. Just me, I'm not ready to ink myself with some glass blowing themed thing just yet. Hell yeah, that's wise for sure. And uh, last, but I'm definitely oh. a piper for my whole life. So eventually, I'll get I'll get a tattoo of it. We'll Hell see yeah. Where it is. Hell yeah. Hashtag uh, piper life or something. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the last question I was like to ask is, what are your top five favorite tools to use besides your torch and glasses? Well, yeah, obviously, torch and the glasses. Uh, my tools that I use, I literally have a pair of 10-inch tweezers, uh, a pair of reverse tweezers, which are like that's my favorite tool to use because I open all my glass with it. And I'll pop a little hole and then use my reverse tweezers to flare it open. And then my uh, my mini torch, my Smith Little with my blast shield torch tip on it. That's my go-to for a lot of stuff. I have a custom blast shield tool that I had to make me. It's basically a three and a half inch long graphite cone that starts at an inch and tapers down to a point. And I use that for everything, whether it's flaring or 
uh, <clears throat> rounding out something. Or I use it as a reamer. Uh, I use it as a lot of stuff. So right, um, and it's like that's a, and that's attached right to your to your uh, shield or your or your marver. No, that's on a handle. That's on a oh, okay. Uh, it would handle okay uh and then i think that's four tools right it's so my last tool would definitely these it's actually a new tool i just got that i'm using the shit out of which are the miniature claw tools the small ones uh you know the the regular claw tools you can you know score and snap big tubes up to like i think it's like 65 millimeters well the claw tools they also make a small one where you can score and snap anywhere from 2 to 26 millimeters yeah. and i use that ah oh, so many times a day because where i used to I'll, you know i'll have a blow tube sitting on the table and i want to open up the end of it i used to either have to use it you know use my flame to open it or usually just my flame but i have to get it hot and pop a hole and open it well this with the claw tool I can literally just score right at the end and just spin it with it wet, and it'll pop off a perfect opening for me to just use a blow tube. Yeah, I use that thing a hundred thousand times a day. It's yeah, a, it's, it's a my new tool. favorite tool. Yeah, yeah. There's a, a speaking of opening blowpipes. Dustin Revere did a video a couple of years ago, and I'm sure I don't know if you've seen it or not. I know a lot of people have. Uh, the one where he folds over the end. Yeah, and pops off the ends. Yeah. Yeah, I used to do that. I'm just not good enough at doing it reliably. I'd get a lot of, I'd pop off the end and it would be really angled. Mm -hmm. It'd be slanted, and I'd have to tear off some to make it even. Yeah. Whereas with these claw tools, the whole reason I bought them is so that I could open my blow tubes really fast. Yes, and yeah, exactly. They're they're the shit. Um, the best forty five dollars I ever spent. Does it have like a uh, like a uh, rubber grippy kind of gimmick in it too? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I got I got them off a of Lampwork Supply. You can get them off there, but they're basically a small version of the regular jaws. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. I I think I've been calling them claws this whole time. There's jaws. <laughs> hey, it's okay. Uh, yeah, but the they're they're a small version. They have a little like loop indentation where you you rest your tube and then a carbide scoring wheel, but. That's your your score for you. Yeah, 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 yeah. The pair that I have is just a basic pair of pliers that they were that were converted into the same tool, basically. It's a cool, oh, okay. It's a cool yeah, I think this is uh, a newer version. They came out with over like last year or something. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they I saw they were carrying them on Lampwork Supply, and then I just got tired of opening my blow tubes by heating it up and popping a hole. Or I would do the fold over thing too. It just still takes, you know, 10, 15 seconds to get it hot and then fold it over and then break that off. Whereas mm. with these, these jaw tools, it takes two seconds. You get your tube wet, spin it around, and it pops you off a perfect hole. So <clears throat> I can't speak highly enough about that tool. Hell yeah. Yeah, man, that's killer. Thanks for sharing that for sure. And, and also, I mean, everything else we talked about, it's, uh, it's always fun talking to a new artist that's yeah absolutely you know, working their ass off and have the conversation yeah yeah absolutely man i'm glad you came on you know initially the idea was to bring everybody on from the tournament and do like a little montage -y kind of gimmick and then whoever wanted to come on separately right, yeah. you know kind of deal and that hadn't that didn't work out timing wise with everybody or whatever not everybody wants to talk on the radio so yeah yeah you said you didn't really get much feedback from from people no there's just two of two of you guys you and tofer that was it interesting yeah <laughs> So I, yeah, you know, a lot of people, that, especially in this tournament, that I've noticed, they're they're busy, man. They're mm -hmm. super busy. I myself, I just was able to barely fit this in with my schedule. So it's a uh, it's a good thing, and it can be a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. Yeah, it's, I'm already dreading the second round, even though I'm hopefully going to get there. <laughs> yeah, you know, when I first when I first entered this tournament, I pretty much resigned myself to being like this is going to be fun but i'm not making it past the first round there's too many other talented artists in here so for me i'm content if i don't make it and i'm really excited if i do make it. so yeah. either way i'll be happy yeah it's just an honor to be in this thing for sure yeah absolutely that's how i feel hell yeah man well that being said if you have any uh you know, before we let you go here if you have any parting piece of advice and then if you want to tell us where we can find you out there in the world of cyberspace uh well my biggest piece of advice is um 
if you're if you're just getting in the glass, just slow down and work on your fundamentals. There's nothing that's going to help you more moving forward when you're three years down the road or five years down the road than having solid fundamentals. You don't want to have to worry about pulling a stringer when you're three years into it. Like seriously, you don't. So that's my biggest piece of advice. Work on your fundamentals as a beginner artist. Just do shit over and over and over and over and over again. <clears throat> and uh, if you're going to be in Dallas in November, come out to BoroCon. We're going to have it uh, the 4th and the 5th of November. There's going to be lots of artists. Uh, Itai Ramil, Bishop's going to be out there. Um, that's Those are the two two that come to mind right now but yeah out, out in dallas go follow borocon on instagram and uh just come out man there's gonna be a lot of people there there's gonna be a lot of cool people there so if you travel for shows travel to dallas in november fuck yeah yeah i'll make sure there's a link in the show notes for that as well for the instagram page awesome. and the website or whatever information about it for sure too and then uh where can we find your ass out there uh i'm i'm pretty much uh, solely on instagram that's where i i thrive i enjoy the instagram community being able to post pictures and videos of my shit so if you're ever looking for me you can find me at keepsake glass on instagram it's all one word um i'm usually in there with my my shop mate gearhead underscore glass he's also on instagram so um that's where you can find find me hell yeah we're quick where'd you get the keepsake name from I, mean, I understand what it means, and that's killer. Right, right. Yeah. No, to be honest, I uh, I had just set up shop on my own and was thinking about what I wanted to call myself. I, I was thinking about an Instagram name, and I wanted to something that was marketable, that the brass tacks, basic, my thought process was, what's going to sound cool enough to where stoners don't question it? They're like, wait, why is he like, they're like, okay, that's fine. But people that don't smoke, they're not going to question it either. They're not going to say, well, is this guy like a stoner or what's the deal? Like, So keepsake glass, it's kind of the best of both worlds. It doesn't have to be pipes, but it can be pipes. That's smart, man. It's, a, it's definitely got to be able to hit all facets of this community because you, know, you can sell pipes all day, but it's also nice to be able to make some other things that you can sell. Yeah, and market it under the same brand, so where yeah, exactly. it's not just solely pipes. That was that was basically where the name came from, and glass. You know, I'm, you're making basically keepsakes. Mm -hmm. These little things that people are like, oh, I like this, I enjoy this. It gives me a feeling to own this. Yeah, it's smart, man. Good job. I'll dig it. Well, thank you. Yeah, not a problem, man. Yeah, so I hope you all enjoyed this episode with uh, Mr. Patrick here. And uh, go check him out on Instagram at Keepsake Glass for sure. And hope you're making lots of keepsakes out there because uh, people definitely like to enjoy collecting glass. And if you're not a glass blower and you're a collector, then you know what that's all about. So thanks again for tuning in to episode 172. Which I, I can't fucking believe it, dude. 100, you'll be 172. <laughs> it's good. It's crazy, man. Jesus. Can you believe that? Yeah, oh my goodness. Yeah, it's amazing. So yeah, and thanks everybody for listening and yourself too, man, for you know spending hours of your time listening to the show. I appreciate you. No, man, it's it's entertaining and informative for especially for glass artists like me. Just keep it up. Hell yeah. I want you to get to five hundred and a thousand before you know it. Yeah, me too. <laughs> when, yeah. I was, when I was doing the three I'll days a week. What's that? What was that? I said I'm honored to have been on it. Oh hell yeah, man! Yeah, yeah, you're uh, on a list of a lot of pretty incredible talent that's been on here. So yeah, welcome, welcome to the Wise Guy Club, for sure. Thanks, man. Be a little schoolgirl. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, hang on for after this. After this, I'll uh, say goodbye off the air here. Yeah. yeah. Well, y'all take it easy, and uh, until next time, we will talk to you on the next episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. Have a good one. Stay hydrated. It's hot out there. Peace. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Glassroots Art Show. Now entering its ninth year, Glassroots is designed for artists and distributors who wish to do wholesale business with shops and galleries. Located at the Monona Terrace Convention Center on beautiful Lake Monona in downtown Madison, Wisconsin, the art show features at least 25 glass workers demonstrating and creating pieces for public viewing, live and silent auctions, raffles, and approximately 40 booths consisting of raw material supplies, functional and non-functional art, and glass charitable organizations. 
This year, in 2017, Glassroots will be held October 9th through the 11th. And for any more information, just go to glassrootsartshow.com. That's glassrootsartshow.com. This episode is also brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lampworking community. This has been accomplished by developing relationships with the finest artists and sharing their techniques with you through in-depth, step-by-step tutorials. In every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting-edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glass Craft Emergent Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lampworking journal. For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com.